We are recording. We are on the records. Welcome to the LISP working group interim meeting. As you know, this interim meeting has been organized because of the recent worldwide events that uh, us to enjoy home. Okay, so the last IETF uh, has been in the majority uh, cancelled. Uh, we will go for a virtual meeting uh, most probably in July when we were supposed to be in Madrid and uh, so we cancelled the, the LISP working group meeting in uh, March and the objective of having an interim meeting today was actually not to have a, an update, the usual update where we are, but rather to trigger some discussion on where we will go okay and uh, discuss technically on the presentation that will follow namely we will have uh, not next hexagon publish subscribe wireguard and uberlay okay i ask it uh, the the presenters to, to tailor the presentation in a way to trigger discussion not just to make an update on the draft okay so Let's hope that this will work out for everybody. And anything anybody wants to add? It's good to be all here, even if virtually. Go to here uh, and see some of you guys. <laughs> ah, by the way, Fabio, welcome in the meeting. I expect an update on the GPE draft. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I, I'm still missing that. Okay. I know. I'm behind with it. Uh, virtually and physically behind so yeah i hope i can i can make progress in the next few days okay so uh who is presenting the nut uh um, proposal is alberto i'll give you the ball uh no alberto lopez albert lopez or albert cabello right albert lopez no. Okay, sorry. Three Albert, so it gets kind of yeah, a bit. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Man, you should change name. <laughs> Too many. <laughs> so you can share the screen. Excellent. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Albert Lopez and I will present some corner cases that we have found studying the lead NAS traversal draft while we were implementing it on the WALOR. NAT uh, is a critical point for these mobile nodes, devices that are constantly moving and changing their endpoints connection. Usually, we see an LT connections are behind NAT so it is a critical to have a robust protocol covering all corner cases. Uh, when studying the, the draft, we have noticed that some aspects are not covered or are not enough explained in the draft. These are basically related to mappings update, but also others like path reachability. During this presentation, I will try to cover them. With double war, implementation, we, we have uh, overcome some of these drawbacks by defining the policy that if a device can be behind NAT, then connect always through an RTR, which doesn't change. But we think this is not the solution and also not solve all the situations. As I told before, one of the main problems we have detected is the map, cap, map catch update. LISP offers several mechanisms to update the catch, exp uh, like exp uh, expiration time, SMR, or public subscribe. I believe that TTL is not a good option, as in order to work properly, the TTL will need to be or uh, order of the order of few seconds, which will implicate a high rate of control message that most of times will be to notify no changes. Also, 
If the request is done by a mobile node, this implicates an unnecessary battery drain. Then we have SMR option. When we are using NAT, usually we only have a default catch entry pointing to our RTRs. So we cannot notify directly or remote ETRs of the change of our ma mapping. We will, go, we will go to this later. And finally, public subscribe draft, which I believe it is uh, a very good option, but it is not uh, specified in the former RFC. When we are talking on the update of a mapping in the RTR, uh, the draft specifies that the map catch entry is updated while processing the encapsulated map register sent by the XTR. But what happens if we want to stop using a specific RTR? We need a mechanism to unregister this RTR. Following the same mechanism, I believe the option would be to send a, a last encapsulation map register to the RTR with the new mapping. Also, from the point of view of the X XTR, once detecting we are not behind that, the default catch entry should be removed in order to start populating the new catches. Another mechanism specified by LISP to update a mapping is the SMR procedure, but the draft doesn't specify which should be the behavior of an RTR receiving it. Some options would be to send a message to the appropriate ETRs, which implicates that the RTR might, uh, should maintain the status of the remote ETRs for its EAD, which I believe is not feasible. Another option would be to update the mapping with the usual procedure, but what happens with the status learned by the RTR? Finally, I can, it can ignore it, and the mapping can just be updated with the proceeding of encapsulated map register. In order to accentuate the problem of the state in the usual SNR procedure of option two, Imagine the, uh, that we have this scenario where an RTR has the status to forward traffic to a mobile node. An external element sends an SMR to an RTR for the EIDA. Uh, the RTR follows the usual procedure and that gets a mapping replacing the old mapping with the state to punch the NAT with the, an unuseful mapping that breaks connectivity. So if this is, option is selected previously to update the mapping, the RTR should do some checks in order to know if the mapping should be replaced or not, like checking if its RTR address is still appears in the mapping. Another scenario I would like to notice is when a device does a, does a handover from NAT to IPv6. Here we have this scenario where the EADA, which is behind NAT, has established a connection with EADB. Now the, the EADA handovers to an IPv6 address, but as we don't know any IPv6 address of the RTR, we cannot update its mapping with the consequent loss of all connections previously established until, until their catch expires. A possible solution to fix this scenario would be that the announced, uh, that the announced RTR by the info reply also contain IPv6 addresses of the RTR. As the info reply can contain information for several RTRs, and we don't know which IPv6 is associated with the RTR we are using, then the solution will be to notify the complete, complete list of RTRs learned with the info reply. A third scenario uh, that has been somehow covered before is the procedure. Albert, can I ask you something on the previous slide? Yes. So just to understand, um, the, in the second case, you were asking that on the RTR, we have also an IPv6 connection uh, address so that we can notify the, the RTR that 
we actually switch it to an IPv6 connection. But this doesn't mean that the traffic goes through the RTR. It's just that in this way, the RTR knows that we have IPv6 somewhere else and can send a, a notify the, the XTR to update the, their mappings with an SMR, for example. Is that what you mean? Uh, yes, uh, if we don't have IPv6, we cannot do anything. So if we, if the RTR have IPv6, depending of how we implement the, the notification procedure, mm -hmm. uh, the RTR will uh, re-encapsulate the traffic to the IPv6 airlock of the mobile node, or if uh, notif it notifies to the uh, remote ITR, then we'll, uh, the traffic will go directly. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, another scenario that has been somehow covered before is the procedure to change dissociated RTR in the case we assume that the mapping of the RTR is updated, but the same ITR is still using the RTR. So the EADA should be unregistered from the RTR1 by the encapsulated map register procedure or SNR. In this scenario, when starting to use RTR2, we notify RTR1 to update its mapping. So now to reach EADA, the packets are sent from XTR to RTR1 and it's re-encapsulated it to RTR2, who serves the packet to mobile node. If we change again to RTR3, we can notify RTR2, but not RTR1, as we don't maintain the catch with the RTR1. Now, the patch is increased one hope more, from XTR to RTR1, then RTR2, then RTR3, to read finally the mobile node. Even this procedure will only happen during TTL time. If we, some, if we somehow have a history of used RTRs, we can notify all them in order to not increase the path length of the connection. The final scenario is related to path reachability. For instance, if we have this scenario where a mobile node is registering two RTRs and at uh, some point, we lose connection with RTR2. As the mapping still contains RTR2 due to the mapping is registered through RTR1, if, XT if XTR decides to use RTR2 to reach the mobile node, its airlock proof will say that EADA is reachable and all traffic will be lost. To mitigate this scenario, we can uh, combine two solutions. Firstly, if the mobile node doesn't receive data map notifies from RTR2, this will mean there is not connectivity and it should remove it from the registration from the registered mapping. This could be combined with the RTR should check the status of an EAD in the catch before replying a proof to the EAD. If the status is not active, then the RTR2 should not replay to the proof message. Conclude, we have seen some drawbacks that the current NAT traversal draft have, and I think it will be good to discuss them to improve a so critical draft for mobility. Uh, so here we conclude my presentation. If you have any questions, comments. Question, Joel, are you monitoring the chat? Hello. Sorry. Yes, Dino, you're up. I was monitoring and then I looked away and <laughs> Dino put two cues up. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, first question is on slide 11. Could you go to slide 11, Albert? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, so you were discussing how um, the mapping has to be updated by the mobile node to switch from RT, RTR2 to RTR3 but it's not sufficient because the XTR has to know about it. So there has to be an SMR or PubSub procedure that goes to the XTR where EIDB is. 
you didn't mention that. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the two options that I mentioned uh, told at the beginning. Uh, the first option is that uh, the RTR uh, does a proxy uh, forwards the SMR to the to the remote ITRs of the of the AAD. Uh, in the second option, uh, what we do is uh, update the the mapping of the RTR. So now the RTR is not doing uh, not traversal functionalities, but uh, uh, acts as an RTR. So the traffic is uh, re encapsulated. So in this scenario, uh, the RTR one have uh, so, uh, have the the destination airlock to reach EDA to go to RTR2. So the traffic XTR will send the traffic to RTR1. The RTR1 will rank up. Wait, wait. Slow down, slow down, because you're just repeating what you said last time. Are, are you showing on this slide that there's two possible solutions or one? Uh, in this scenario, it's just one. I'm, I'm focusing in the case where um, the uh, the RTR is re-encapsulating the traffic instead of notifying the remote ITRs. But it says SMR all learned RTRs. You have to SMR all remote XTRs. Or they won't know which RTR to use. If they pick an RTR that no longer can get through the NAT, then the packets are going to be dropped. Could you repeat, please? You have to tell the remote XTRs that are encapsulating packets to the existing RTRs where there's pinholes going through the NAT. And in this case, you're saying that RTR2 and RTR3 now can get packets through the NAT where the list mobile node is at, right? But if remote XTRs need to know to use RTR2 and RTR3, and so you need to SMR them to know that the mapping for the remote the mobile node EID has changed. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the idea is that as we can not notify the the remote IT, ITR. You have to. Uh, you, so when you SMR, you have to SMR the RTRs so they knew so they know the new translated information for the mobile node. But you also have to SMR the remote ITRs that use those IT those changed RTRs. But for instance, if the XT, XTR uh, only have a unidirectional connection, so the mobile node doesn't know about, doesn't have populated his cache of the regarding EADV, there is no way uh, the mobile node notifies EADV uh, about this change. No, it's not the, the mobile node. That's why SMRs are not a good solution. If the, see, what happens is the mobile node is the only one that can control its translated RLOG as well as the RTRs it uses. So it needs to register that information in the mapping system. And the mapping system is the only one who can notify all the ITRs that use that mapping. And so PubSub is the best, PubSub is the best solution for this. I'm completely agree with these options, but as uh, SMR is a procedure then of the specified in list, I believe that we should also provide a solution or explanation to, uh, of what an RTR should do with this um, uh, SMR. See, SMRs are a adequate solution when ITRs and ETRs are talking directly with each other and they know that there's bi-directional traffic. So when a mapping changes at an ETR, it knows who to SMR. But in this case, you don't, because you have this um, level of indirection in a sense. What are you suggesting, Dino, is that, um, and this is Fabio, is that um, we, we go ahead and we focus uh, only on the PubSub solution? Is that what you? The other ones can't work because unless you and the other ones can work if you set the TTLs down real low. It's the typical it, it, the, the, what we're doing here has nothing to do with net traversal in a sense. 
It has to do with notifying um, encapsulators when mappings change. It doesn't matter what the contents of the mapping is. If they're translated RLOGs, global RLOGs, or RTRs that are in the mapping, these are mapping changes that have to be notified to encapsulators. That's the general problem. And we have solutions. Albert, we have many solutions for that. Let's let everybody get the floor. Albert. Yeah, thanks, Joel. So um, I agree that so we didn't consider poop soup because it's it's not it was not deployed on the infrastructure where we tested it, and this is based on the experience of testing uh, our least mobile node with NAT on the wild. Which means that since the least beta didn't support uh, pubs up, that's the only choices we had uh, on that time. Um, I agree that there is a debate on whether to use pubs up. And uh, I would like to have also this debate on the list wire guard presentation because we support mobility without pops up or SMR. Uh, Albert. Okay, uh, from where I sit, it sounded like some of the concern here was there was a need to improve the NAT procedures, but there was concern about the status of the SMR work. It seems to me, not the SMR, the pub sub work. It seems to me that. If we need to publish a revision to the network, and it sounds like we do, there are some corner cases that don't work in the current description, it is perfectly reasonable if we think it is the best answer for that revision to point at pub sub as the way to solve some of these problems. Up to you guys whether that is indeed the right answer, but I don't want anybody thinking that the status of the work is a reason why we can't point at that. We got enough coupled stuff we're gonna clear anyway Coupling an improvement to the NAT to a mechanism to improve the NAT is perfectly reasonable. Yeah, and that's that's one of the main takeaways in my understanding of this presentation, right? Is that once we deployed it on the wild, we found many, many corner cases which which are super specific but fundamentally necessary for, for it to May add, I, I totally agree with Joel, the fact that um, if we move forward, uh, we, we can clearly state that we need pops up for, to, to, to do not traversal. Um, if the, the, in such a way, the solution is simpler. And uh, also because if any way we move to pops up and there will be a, a not traversal with pops up, then we have something that we will never use with SMR or, or, or other stuff. So uh, I think the, the, the work will be much more streamlined if we go for pops up. Now, I, I understand, Albert, why we are here and why you, you explore different solution, okay? Because it's implementation experience, but maybe we should go in the pops up direction. So, yeah, I, and I'm not against that. Eh? I, I was just saying why we took this one because it was the only the only way to move forward on that time. But I, I fully agree on that debate. Sure, sure. It's totally understandable what you did so far. Natal, another Albert, I believe. <laughs> uh, that's, 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 thank you, Joel. Yeah. Um, so one one quick remark here. So even though I agree that perhaps up is the way to go. Uh, we need to put all the options on the table, and I think that this uh, can work better with SMR if we allow the RTRs to then SMR to the remote FTRs. So that in the diagram that you have here, FTR2, FTR3 receive the SMR from the mobile node, and then on their own, they forward that SMR or they recreate that SMR towards the remote FTRs that they know on their map caches. Right? So that's, that's another option. Yeah. You can't do that because there may not be bi-directional traffic. I agree, I agree, but they can send it at least to all the ones that they have. So uh, that's, that's what I said, that you, I agree that pops up not, is the way to go. You will not up. No, let's try to let people. <laughs> but I, I, to clarify, it is perfectly reasonable in the document to write a document that says, the right answer is pub sub. If you're not doing pub sub because you believe you can't do that, you should be using SMR this way with, to at least improve your coverage, but that has these drawbacks. We can say these kinds of things. And documenting the problems we found is a good thing. So I appreciate the effort that's gone in here and we can we can 
both keep the, 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 the ideas you've got here and move forward with what we think is the right answer. The queue is empty. Well, I had two plus queues and I did a minus queue. So I have another question. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, I lost count. <laughs> Could you go to slide 12, please? Um, so I don't know if this, um, Albert, I don't know if you were explaining the comment that I made in email about um, the RTRs that are being selected by the list mobile node um, can be reachable by a remote XTR. Like you said, um, if the mobile node advertises RTR1 and RTR2 and XTR chooses one, it also can our load probe fail one of the paths and choose another one. But if if it our load probes and both those paths are are um, reachable, yes, it could choose an RTR that can't reach the mobile node. So I just want to clarify: um, if the mobile node cannot reach an RTR, it should exclude it from the mapping. Was that the point you're trying to make? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Seems there is no further question. I so just um, one question, general question to the authors of the uh, not traversal document. When are you going to update the document? <laughs> this feedback. <laughs> So maybe one question, uh, and I mean, it's not probably a good idea to answer to a question with a question, but uh, what is the suggestion of the chairs, right? So I think I, I understood from this conversation is uh, focus on the mechanism that you think is more most promising, that is PubSub, um, um, but, you know, document also that uh, um, uh, a solution can be improved if you, in case you don't have PubSub by using SMR, uh, document why uh, in, in the document. Uh, that means, in my understanding, that uh, this document should refer to the RFCBs. And, uh, and basically, the goal is to work toward a document that is, uh, uh, you know, that is going to be referring to, to those documents. Is that, is that uh, what you would suggest, uh, Luigi and Joel, as, uh, as chair? So, so because the, they are on standard track. Yes, you have to refer to those documents. Then you have to, you you will have a, a, a normative dependency on uh, the PubSub document because if you use PubSub to to, to do not travel cell, then you have a, a normative re dependency there. And um, there is also one other thing. Um, you should have a look to other RFCs speak about not traversal in general for all the protocols and technology why i say that because uh, in the the ietf there are documents that say there are different types of NAT, and when you have different types of NAT, you can traverse them in a different way so we, you should have a look to that because if we don't do it and we go for publication somebody will do the remark and say how does it work, this mechanism, when I have different types of NAT? Does it work in the same way? Is it sufficient? Is not sufficient? Is an overkill? I don't know. See? So this is something that needs to be added as well to the document. OK. So the, the, the current status of the draft is uh, experimental. So does it mean that we should uh, mm, you know, change that, uh, uh, and so that will be reflected in the. I mean, I think it's open for discussion, right? I'm I'm open to to to, to all the opportunities, but um, 
is that the path that you are suggesting, Luigi? Uh, not really. <laughs> what I'm suggesting is that you refer to the to the um, to the latest document sets of documents. Okay. Whether okay. we should move the, this document from experimental to proposed standard, I, I'm unsure because uh, 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 do we have sufficient uh, experience to to make that step? Okay. Uh, I have a comment related to that. Is it okay if I can ask the question now? Please. So um, this net traversal spec's been around for more than eight years, and we don't have any interoperable implementations. We have one implementation that's kind of beta that's done by a vendor that really hasn't shipped. And I've been deploying um, devices behind NATs for that length of time. And I have concluded and tried to implement this draft, and it's way more complicated than it needs to be. NAT traversal is so important to get LISP deployed easily. And I have a simpler solution that I implemented that I have been using for seven or eight years now. And so I would not um, propose this to go to proposed standard as is, and that we need to greatly simplify it. Um, I have deployments where I put devices behind NATs at home um, in mobile nodes that are using NAT devices at um, mobile providers. Um, can, when they're in containers, they go through NATs. When they're in VMs and cloud providers, they go through NATs. NAT is like a crucial uh, and very important part for LIST to solve, or they just won't have any deployability in those environments which are 90% of the cases. The other cases it's deployed are enterprises where everything's inside a firewall and all the R-Lokes are global. And, um, but if you want it to be implemented out in the wild for a lot of these things, I mean, just look at Sharon's next Nexagon case, that's gonna be through NAT traversal as well. And um, so nobody has really, I mean, we really have to take a look at this design. It's way too complicated and we have to ask why nobody has implemented, why there aren't multiple implementations according to this draft. Where is your document, Dino? If you are saying you have a simpler solution and uh, you say that you, we, we need something to discuss, so yeah. you should uh, document uh, your solution. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense that you say, oh, I would keep it this document experimental because I have a simpler solution. Yeah. So um, you uh, have to document it and bring it to the table. Yes, I, I understand. Um, um, Fabio, Albert, and I were going to put a document together and we just haven't gotten to it yet. So this is something that's been kind of happening for a couple years. And the reason we didn't put effort into it is because we knew the working group wouldn't accept it because it wasn't critical work yet. So we need to know if we could start working on this. So we're just, we're sorting out our priorities as well. <laughs> I think it's about the right time to start work on it. <laughs> okay, thank you for that. No more comments or questions? So, in this case, we, we got to the next, which is uh, Nexagon. Is uh, Sharon presenting? And I need to give him the Excellent, Sharon. Well, I found the unmute. <laughs> can you see this? Yes, we can. Perfect. Too much zoom in the last two months. Okay, uh, I'll do a quick uh, recap of the of the draft just because it's new, and then uh, I'm going to touch on a few touchy points, uh, sensitive ones, and uh, we'll welcome uh, any feedback from the group uh, if it's okay. All right, so the goal is uh, to leverage all these uh, AI cams in all these cars. Uh, practically every car will have one. Uh, using um, a list multi-point to multi-point channels um, between uh, cameras and apps. So this is done by aggregating uh, what the, the eyes, the AI eyes see, their different perspective uh, into an EID. And 
then uh, this EID is uh, a signal free channel map apps can subscribe to construction apps, uh, construction map apps, uh, Apple Maps, uh, driving apps, uh, all sorts. Um, the, the partition to, of the world to list channels is based on a grid. The grid uh, chosen is H3. Um, this is because of its um, very elegant hierarchy uh, and very clear and neighboring for propagating uh, impacts of things. But it can easily be translated to sleepy tiles, other tiles, using the same channel technology. Um, the way it works, for example, over a mobile network uh, is that uh, the uh, EAD H3 services are hosted at the edge. And uh, as a car uh, drives by and sees stuff, it sends uh, uh, to the EAD what it saw, and the EAD uh, multicasts it to whoever needs to know. Here is an example of cars finding parking for other cars. Uh, this car saw uh, this parking spot being available, it doesn't need it, but it does see it, and it sends uh, uh, to the edge RTR RLOC uh, with the SIM CAM RLOC. This is uh, how we traverse NAT. Uh, each H3 service R9 hierarchy, which is uh, a few blocks, uh, representing a few blocks, uh, with the mobility client EID, which is a uh, it's EAD, uh, sort of temporary EAD it gets every time to be able to participate in this uh, network. And then from there on, it just doubles where what, and in this case is in which tile there is a free parking and each tile there is a free parking, because uh, it's like two tiles. All right, now these tiles are hot for any parking app. This is how it looks like in the draft uh, informational. Uh, that's the tuples. These are the addresses that we've used. And uh, this is the topology of uh, how you um, distribute this, this uh, information using these channels. It can be captured uh, very simply. Uh, this whole informational does not change anything in this. It leverages uh, existing mechanisms. Uh, the mobility clients parse the street view that they see, they localize and publish to the h 3 ad service. They use access tunnels to list uh, RTRs. The RTRs are map assisted. The tunnels are just simple tunnels and uh, it relies on the fact that there is connectivity, IP connectivity, and we need lists for logical connectivity. The flip side is that uh, mobility AD clients on a need-to-know basis, on an interest basis, there's an MLD report to the RTRs with a S, G, S is the R9, where, and G is what theme, both of them are EIDs. The head RTRs, which receives from the H3 service uh, updates on a theme and an R, specific R9, specific theme, replicate it to all the uh, uh, subscribed RTRs. The subscribed RTRs replicate it to the EID client. All right, so discussion point uh, one. Uh, as we said, the, the anchoring of these uh, multipoint uh, channels are uh, R9, are represented by this grid. It's very easy to algorithmically come up with the EID uh, for these uh, uh, EIDs because uh, the general GPS, uh, if you just uh, remove a few digits, uh, translates to uh, a hexagon ID, which is the EID. Well, I mean, with some massaging, it becomes an EID. Uh, but the R15, which is where exactly did I see what I saw, that's a little bit more tricky because GPS are, is very inaccurate. It uh, jitters a lot. It uh, fluctuates, and you can compensate by aggregating a few people who saw said they saw the same thing, and in the tide, it's very efficient to cluster 
uh, detections together and come up with uh, where you think it's really, it really is. Uh, and it's also uh, getting better with RTK, but RTK doesn't always uh, solve GPS problems in urban areas. It's not the same as uh, a like uh, sunspot interference. It's like building interference. So uh, one very very efficient method is uh, use anchor frames. So uh, you see the the frame on the left is from Street View, it's very accurate, very expensive to obtain, uh, and uses the triangulation to known places and uh, uh, very expensive technologies that are applied once a quarter, once a year to a location. But the, the data in it is, uh, is, is, the fresh data is completely out of date. The, the, the frame on the right, is very accurate. You see the stop sign, uh, something happened to it, it turned. Uh, you see there is a pedestrian, you see if there is a parking spot, you see if somebody maybe never moved his car, <laughs> which is also important information, uh, but the location is not that accurate. So what if uh, as we drive along and we see like a free parking spot, we also send a frame uh, with annotation, uh, and that can be matched with an anchor frame from a street view and get a, a very, very, very accurate positioning of exactly where the car sits. Um, the trade-off, of course, is that uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is tricky territory because uh, this is, uh, uh, can be seen as some sort of surveillance. There's also more bandwidth uh, involved in this problem. Uh, one mitigation which may or may not be acceptable is that uh, it's very easy for the client to blur a, and anonymize everything about the picture, uh, even sometimes leave it uh, uncomprehensible to human eye, but very comprehensible to uh, localization uh, algorithm that will, will uh, find the exact anchor frame which matches it. Uh, and therefore avoid any uh, privacy issues. So it's a touchy point. I just bring it here, interested in any possible inputs on, uh, I'm not gonna put it in the text, but I just want to know, you know, you know it's, I'm thinking about it. We are thinking about it. And glad to have your opinion. Uh, the second point, which I'd love feedback on, uh, is uh, the sound methodology that they're using this to to do this cloudless processing. Uh, so we know, you know, network processing is not new. Uh, the classical model is uh, SFC, and uh, it's a bit different than what we do here. And it's interesting to look at the differences. Uh, in SFC, when we're doing network processing, uh, we use a addressable functions, network functions, uh, using the overlay, we attach addresses and we traverse the, these VMs or uh, as if they were physical devices. But the states that these functions need, they are prefetched, like the whitelist, the blacklist, the filters, whatever it is they need in order to operate correctly are prefetched. So the, the functions are addressable, the states are prefetched. In this model, uh, it's the opposite. Uh, the states are addressable, the state of the road, the nexagons, and the functions, the assumption is function is just a piece of code that doesn't change, so I can prefetch it. If it's to do uh, some clustering or if it is to assign severity or classification for a theme, uh, it's just code. I can just fetch it from anywhere and therefore it, uh, it can be prefetched. So it's uh, interesting to look at that. Uh, and, uh, and see that, uh, you know, this allows us to do, uh, in, in this case, to implement these um, uh, LISP channels where we apply functions at the state, uh, but uh, uh, for, for the purpose of sharing uh, AI cameras, but it has, uh, it may have more broader uh, applications, there are, there's a lot of stuff that you cannot uh, process at the cloud 
you can process at the edge of, uh, for example, almost all media. It's almost impossible to move media to the cloud, uh, like it takes forever, but it is possible to um, annotate it at the edge uh, and create uh, these channels that can be stored anywhere in the cloud. And you can do that by, uh, by uh, partitioning using uh, algorithmically source routed addresses like the IDs. I thought it may be interesting to, to look at that. Um, that's it. Uh, if there's any questions, opinions, I'm happy, happy to hear. Okay, two things. First, I'm going to uh, interrupt this for a public service announcement. Please sign into the blue sheet. There are 24 people listed here, and there are like 10, 11 on the blue sheet. We need everybody to sign in. It is part of the rules, please. Second, just to clarify something, while I appreciate your point about being able to pre-stage the compute and just send the data to the right to, to wherever it's to keep the data shipped less. Don't compare that with SFC, please. Because SFC is about sending something, diverting something to an entity to which it is not addressed. And right. in this case, you are addressing the data to the function. It's just you're going to move the function closer to the user by using Lisp to map to where to send it. And I get that. It's just the comparison to SFC just really bothered me as SFC co-chair. Got it. Got it. <laughs> okay. Okay. I understand. It was uh, like, uh, hey, we're going to use the, uh, an overlay network to do compute. Uh, we do it already, but uh, you're right. It's uh, for transparent uh, uh, computing, and this is for explicit computing. You're right. And I do the, the point of by using Lisp, you can move the stuff around, pre stage it where you want the function where you want it. Maybe it's closer to the user, maybe it's not. That's a deployment choice. You get the flexibility. I, I understand that value. I was just, I, so I wasn't disagreeing with the fact that there is value in what you're doing. It was just the way you presented it. Are there questions from anybody else? There's nobody on the queue, but uh, does anybody else want to speak up? One quick one. Um, so, Sharon, on the um, on the first dis discussion point that you brought the, about um, for instance, the the empty parking spots and whatnot. So, uh, you were considering using the the mapping system directly as the place to store this information, or just as a way to get to the place where the information is actually stored? Uh, no, just to get to. You you mean the the image uh, mapping the, the location? um yeah, just yeah. To, this, this this one yeah yeah this is uh just to get to to the r9 tile uh that has a bunch of anchor images for all the smaller tiles in it or some of them or most of them uh, best match and it's very quick to sort of compare especially in uh, using these um, networks uh, uh in the edge uh where exactly is he? So the difference between anonymizing in the client, which is e really easy, because uh, I don't need to know anything. There's no state in it. I'm just wiping out anything which is not building skyline, things like that. Uh, but here, uh, this the client is very hard for him to do that because he cannot store. But the the state, the R9 can can do that. The mapping system is just to be able to um, manage orchestrate this whole this whole uh, uh, channelization that, that's the goal of the mapping system i assume it's working it's perfect it has pops up you know works over tunnels yeah that's, that's what they thought but uh, yeah i wanted to clarify just think okay thanks Sarah. Thank you. all right so that's it for me Well, just a note on the blue sheet that might not be clear to everyone. Uh, th there is a link on the chat section of the WebEx. Uh, for the blue sheets. Yeah, for the blue sheet, yeah. And now it has been reposted. Okay. Thank you. Yes, and it is a good point that Padma, Padma posted. Please state your names while we can 
well, if she can guess a lot, she shouldn't have to. And my apologies, Padma, for not doing so when I spoke. Luigi, let's move it on. Yes, I was just uh, saying that uh, unless there are other questions, we move on to the next uh, presentation, which is Pops Up, which has been referred to in the previous presentations. So let's see what they what they have. Who's going to present the, the Pops Up? I, I will, Luigi. This is Alberto, by the way. Alberto. So you should have the ball now. So okay. There you go. I guess that you can see the slides now, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So there was a lot of comments on on Pavsa early on, and I think that um, yeah, I think that Pavsa is a is a um, good thing that we are bringing to list, but I think we need to work a bit on, on it. There are some aspects I wanted to discuss and I think this interim is a, is a great opportunity to do so. Um, so a quick recap on, on PAPS app um, for those of you that, that haven't taken a look at the draft for a while. Uh, the draft has been uh, with almost the same content for, for some time now so it hasn't changed uh, um, a lot. It, it may change some stuff after this discussion, we'll see. But the, the basic idea with PAPS app is that when using a map request, you can uh, set uh, a new bit that we introduce in the draft, that is the end bit for the I1 notification. Uh, you can send the end bit to one, and, and then you include the dexterity so that the map server can identify you. And that uh, goes to the map server, and if the map server supports uh, PAP sub operation and wants to subscribe you, it will uh, notify back to you that you have been subscribed by sending back a map notify instead of a map request. If the map server doesn't allow uh, pops up or doesn't support it, it will send back a map reply. So it will be a standard disk operation. It will be ignoring the, the end bit, basically. That's the, the subscription uh, mechanism. The, the publication is where whenever there is an update on the on the airlock set for a particular mapping on the map server, the map server will go through the list of XTRs and it will use the XTR ID for that. It will go through the list of XTRs that have been subscribed to that map, and I will send a, a publication to those in the form of a map notify. And then the, the, the ITR will send back a map notify act to acknowledge the, the, the notify that was the publication. And then just to complete the, the story, the unsubscribe is done. If, if the ITR triggers unsubscribe, is uh, just sending a, again a map request with the bit, but with no ITR airlocks saying that's the way we have to signal that the ITR doesn't want to be uh, notified anymore. And if it's the map server, the one that is unsubscribing, then the way to signal that to the ITR is by sending a map notify uh, with TTL equals zero. Okay, so that's uh, perhaps having a nutshell. Uh, so now, the questions uh, that at least I have, and I guess that some of you guys have, uh, and feel free to ask here. So, the, the biggest one for me at least is how we establish an ITR map server security association. and we have some options on the slides uh, we'll discuss, and probably this will take most of the time on the presentation. Then, um, how we handle the incremental nonsense uh, in PubSat uh, following the, the same approach as in, in the these documents, where we use incremental nonsense to prevent uh, reply attacks. And then a minor note on, on a the description that should be really quick. So let's let's get into the security association. So, uh, there was some discussion on the on the list, and and then there was some discussion about the authors as well, and, and we wanted to bring it to the to the working group to, to hear different opinions. Uh, we have at least two options. There may be uh, more. So let me let me maybe um, go through through uh, the options that we have documented, and then we can uh, have some discussion on the on the security association before we move on to the next topics. So so this is option one. This is uh, based on the discussion and the on the mailing list about using LeadSec as a way to, to populate uh, a search secret between the, the ITR and the and the map server. And in this in this option, so it's, it's a, a modification of the discussion on the, on the mailing list. So basically here, uh, when you send the, the map request as an ATR, you encap that uh, map request uh, in LeadSec using uh, the, the LeadSec, uh, standard LeadSec uh, operation. Uh, and then on the map server side, when, when you're a master and you receive this uh, list sec map request with the MBIT set, 
what you do is that you generate a random seed. Uh, later, I will be used to generate a map search. So, so the map search generates a random seed, and then in the uh, map reply that it sends back to the to the XDR following this sec, it not only includes you know the the standard this uh, authentication data, but it also includes the pub sub seed. Uh, and this is a bit different from what we discussed in the mailing list. In the mailing list, we were saying um, let's generate directly a, a pub sub key on the on the map server and include it in the map reply. Uh, we we modify that a bit. So instead of including the, directly the key, we include a seed that can be used then to compute the key. Uh, just because, uh, and we need to maybe uh, check this with with security experts. But by using a seed, maybe you don't need to encrypt the seed; just authenticate the seed, since the the key is is never in clear in the in the in the path, and and the both ends can 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 generate it on their own. Um, so then the, the ITR receives this this seed. Uh, it generates the the key with the seed plus OTK. So both ends, the map server and the ITR have both the seed and the and the OTK at the end of the exchange. And then from now on, whenever the map server has to send a a, a publication via map notify, it can use this this search secret um, the pub key to to sign the the map notifies and the, the ITR. Can uh, regenerate the the keys uh, whenever it wants by just uh, redoing this this process. Um, this is an option, for instance, to include the pub sub seed on the list sec uh, authentication data. This is basically taking uh, map reply authentication data type one and then extending it to to have the seed, so it will be type two, and then with the seed at the at the bottom. Now, one one aspect with this approach is that. Um, if you remember the, the overview at the very beginning, we were saying that the way to uh, acknowledge the subscription request is by sending a map notify. However, here we we need to send somehow a map reply because the map reply is the one in Blisec. The map reply is the one that is carrying the authentication data. So if we want to go this route, maybe we should consider uh, using a map reply with some extra bit or something, or directly the the authentication data as a signal. To acknowledge the the subscribe the subscribe request. Um, and I see a question for Dino. Dino, maybe let me finish the other option and then we can take all together. Uh, so okay. So the other option that that we were uh, considering is to use directly the 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 OTK as the seed, or another option could be to include the seed on the on the map request directly. So basically, that means that the 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 ITR will drive the generation of the of the seed or the or the or the OTK, and and the map server just needs to to use it. So this will allow to keep using the map notify as the subscription is uh, So we can keep the current implementations that are there that are using map notify as the subscription OTK. Sorry, as the subscription ACK, and and then you don't need to to change that much on the list sec exchange. You can just take the the one time key. Um, one thing to notice is that the the, the one time key should be encrypted uh, end to end in the path between the ITR and the map server. That is a standard list sec operation, so it it, it shouldn't go in clear uh, because list sec is protecting the path from the from the uh, map server or the ETR back to the um, reply directly to the to the ITR. Uh, uh, so the the rest of the path that is from the from the ITR through the map resolver to the map server should be encrypted or or protected. So so that's that. Uh, so that's it for the security association. Maybe let's discuss this now. I, I guess Dino, you want to comment? Yeah. Can you go to slide five, please? Um, uh, one more back, sorry. Uh, no, sorry, slide six. This one. Um, uh, no, um, go to go back one. What What do you want to it, discuss? I, I, I where, the where the the lot the sequence was. Yeah, it's four. It's four. This one. Yeah, I've um. This is 
the sequence for the one with the seed and the, the map server generating the seed. Yeah, uh, just a clarification question. When you said the pub sub key is derived from the OTK plus the seed, is the seed just actually a password that's used to um, sign the map reply? Or no, is, it I, being, I, is it being, is the two, the two tuple together being used to sign the map notify? That's correct, the second option. And, and it's not gonna be direct to the table, but a derivation from that table. Okay, so the C yeah. is created once and only could be only be changed when another map request is sent. Um, but yeah. but if there's a bunch of map replies that come, a map notifies that come because of our look set changes, that means this one time key is used more than one time, right? Well, so this derived. Well, Fabio, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, it is Fabio. Um, so the one time key is used once in the context of LISPSEC to uh, basically authenticate the map uh, reply that is going from the map server to the ITR. We also use the one time key in LISPSEC to derive uh, another key, for example, that is used to protect the communication from the uh, ETR to the IT uh, to protect the, 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 the authentication, the authenticated data that, is, that are part of the map reply there. Yeah, so yeah, but that's, only, but that's yeah. only being done once for a map request, map reply exchange. Yeah, yeah. Right? What, the, what we are proposing here is basically saying, okay, since there is a um, an association, right, established now from the ITR and the map server, um, we can use that association to derive another key uh, that is to authenticate. To, to, to basically authenticate the, the map notify protocol. Um, it is true that, you know, I mean, we, we change, the, the, we, we call the one time key because when we designed this protocol some years ago, uh, you know, we thought, you know, we, we thought only to this application. In this case, the key that is derived from the one time key has a lifetime that spans longer than the one time key. But right. I think, I mean, okay. we need to work out the details, but uh, I mean, you can probably refresh the key by send uh, another uh, map request. Uh, you can, uh, uh, you know, we can do the, the operation of key management uh, by by basically uh, uh, pigging B uh, on top of the of the LISSEC, uh, of the LISSEC protocol. So uh, those are the so details that need to be worked out. That's fine, Fabio. Then what's the value of adding the C to it? Why not just use the one time key as the. Yeah, is that uh, is that you are basically separating the the lifetime of the derived key from the one time key and having a different purpose for uh, for the keys, right? So uh, no, no, because the one time key and the C come at the same time. So they change. Yes, yes but I mean, the different frequencies. Once you have established a key, you have derived from the one time key, a key that you use to secure the map notify protocol, then you can keep using uh, that key, the derived key, okay, uh, to secure the subsequent messages uh, exchange for the map notify protocol for PubSub in general. So basically you, you can keep sending map notify back and forth uh, and map notify act, uh, protecting that. You have a way to, use another one time key to refresh the key that you are using for the map notify protocol so you're basically decoupling the two key even if they are still derived from the from the from the one time key so maybe trying to describe the key hierarchy here right so the root of trust that is uh, at the base of lisec is the shared key that is between the itr and the map server right that is what we use to bootstrap the one time key and so that is one first level of the hierarchy here. Then uh, we use the one time key, for example, to derive uh, another key that is used to secure the part of the message that goes from the ETR to the ITR. What, uh, what we are suggesting here is we say by using the seed, we also generate another key. Uh, we derive another key from, uh, from the one time key that is used to secure the map notify and map notify acts uh, that are used by the PubSub protocol. So we are basically establishing a little bit of a key hierarchy here, and we need to look into the details of how to manage those keys. But I mean, that is a way to basically separate 
the kind of destiny, right, of each of those keys, uh, depending on their use, on, on how they are used. So the frequency, the frequency of change of each one of those is the same, or is it different? No, not really, in the sense that you can use, for example, um, one one-time key to establish a pub sub key, and you can keep using that pub sub key for you know maybe the lifetime of the pub sub uh, relationship between uh, uh, the the devices that are part of this uh, of this pub sub relationship. Then when you send a new one time key, you can use the new one time key to refresh the pub sub key, right? So they are not one thing that is true is that. Uh, when you generate a new one-time key, then starts the life of a, of a new uh, pub, uh, pub sub key. Uh, but then the life of the pub sub key uh, extends, right, for the, for, the, for the length of the pub sub relationship between the two entities that are involved. And that's, that's basically the, the, the problem. And I mean, uh, we, we are basically trying to use that source of trust that we have and, and, and specializing it to each particular use that uh, that we are doing here. Okay, fine. And let me let me add a bit. Uh, so, so Dino, you know, I think the, the the key distinction between because what what you propose, I, I find too that is using directly the, the one time key. Uh, so that's what I call in the deck option two. So basically, option one is you derive the key from the 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 seed plus the one time key. Option two is you derive the key directly from the one time key. So the difference I see is that in the first option, you generate the key from two pieces of information that never go on the same path, right? Because the one-time key goes on the path from the ITR to the map server, and the seed comes from the path from the map server to the ITR. That are two different paths because one goes through the mapping system, the other goes uh, directly. If, I, I, it seems to me that it's a bit more more secure. But if we believe the map that, resolver, you meant through the map resolver. Through the map resolver, that's right. You know, yeah, yeah. So if we believe that the the option of going just just using the, the one time key as the as the way to derive the the pub sub key and that we trust uh, enough the path from the ITR to the map server through the map resolver, then we can go with option two. That is basically using the one time key directly as the as the as the seed itself to derive the key. So then you can uh, leverage the the what, what what you have today on the protocol so you don't need to to change the yeah. either pops up but you don't need to change a list sec to to support this it seems to me uh, i don't know if less security is the right term it seems to be that that it has a different set of trade-offs in terms of security for for convenience but if this is secure or not which may be because theoretically the the path from the itr to the map server should be secure uh, then we can go with option two and and, and be done with it yeah my second question was a comment saying that this seems simpler because there's not a novel, another level of indirection with keys and that you reduce the CPU cycles because the OTK requires a random number generator, but it's done on the ITR rather than the MS doing it for all the ITRs that it uses. So yeah, I would support option two for sure. Yeah, but this comes at, at, at the price of security. I mean, you're right, but uh, the, the, the trade-off that we're looking for. My... Well, in general, this is requiring that DTLS or TLS be used on all the different segments along the path, right? Yeah, I have two personal comments on this. Um, one is uh, uh, we, we really need to do, think carefully uh, uh, what is the security level we want to provide. I mean, um, uh, but I don't, so the two options, as we just said, comes with different security trade-offs. So is it worth to, to, to go for a simpler solution that maybe later on, maybe a security review will say is not secure enough? Okay, <laughs> let's, let's try to learn for the BIS experience. So <laughs> let's think carefully. <laughs> The level of security we want to add here, so that we we re, we are really sure that once we we push that argument hopefully for for publication, then it doesn't come back with with yeah, and it. stuff. So, and I would say maybe you would you would option one you can may it's more general. So instead 
to having look we have the general solution one other more more um, uh, how to say specific solution in case you are in this 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 these conditions now you have to list what are the conditions okay and it's it, 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 you better be careful there because if you are, don't put the, the right set of conditions, this is a security threat. So, uh, personally, I, I would go for the secure one. <laughs> okay. This is Fabio. I, I, I second what you were just saying, right? I mean, I think we have learned something from the past. And uh, yeah, I mean, I agree that, you know, if we look purely at the optimization, uh, there are trade offs, uh, but I mean, we want to really specify a clean uh, key hierarchy and a clean purpose for each key that we're going to use. And I think it's clear that if we don't do that, uh, then uh, you know the security review is going to be much more complicated. And at the end, uh, I believe, I mean, it's uh, sure the cost here is to creating a random uh, uh, num at the, at the map server and then using a PRF to derive the key. So that doesn't seem to be, I mean, and it's not that we are requesting to do public exponentiation and, you know, crazy thing, right? We are still keeping well within the boundary of an efficient uh, uh, implementation. Uh, and yeah. So would be an option to try to reach out to some of the security experts that may later on do the review so we receive to them early on and request some feedback. Would that be an option? What do the chairs think of that? Sure, absolutely. So maybe yeah, we can we can do that. Um, yeah, I agree with Luigi. Let's let's avoid problems now rather than in the future. Okay. Yeah, and, and I figure let's articulate a little bit the proposal, right? And when we have enough details, uh, then uh, I think you know we now know the types that we should be working with. And uh, and we can do that absolutely. Okay, so then if there are no further questions on this, let me go to the nonce discussion. Okay, so uh, regarding nonces, right? Um, there are a bunch of nonces that that we need to to keep track of in in list now and in list with pops up. So some of them are non-incremental, like the one you have for map request map reply in regular list operation. So that is as a random node. And some are incremental. And the reason of using incremental nodes, we have mentioned it, right, but just to have it in, in, in the mind of everyone, is to prevent against a reply attacks. So when a, a, a man in the middle, for instance, can capture a packet, and even though it may not uh, modify it, it can send it again at a later time and then break the system. So in, in PubSub, uh, since both the subscription and the uh, publication are subject to uh, reply attacks, you need to protect both with incremental nonce. So the, the, the publish should be easy to, to keep track of the nonce. So you have the map server and the XTR sending map notify and map notify act. Uh, and every time a new publication is sent, the nonce is increased. So the XTR can uh, verify that the nonce is, is valid and, and the map uh, notify is accepted. Now on the on the subscription and, and that and the in the public that can be done because the both the, the XDR and the map server are aware of each other. So they can correlate the for each XDR MS pair, they can uh, know the the nonce that is supposed to 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 appear on, on a given packet. Now for the subscription, it's a bit more tricky because as an XDR, you send a map request to subscribe uh, and you need to put an nonce there, but you don't know to which map server that request is gonna go because uh, you send it to your map resolver, not to the map server. So you know to which map resolver you send your request, you don't know to which map server that request will land on. So I'm not sure which is the best option to, to and you want to have incremental announcements because you want to prevent others to, you know, uh, resubscribe you or unsubscribe you in the future to replay your message. So I'm not sure which is the best option to, to address the incremental announcements here. One thing that was proposed was to use uh, a global nonce for all the subscription operation for a given XTR. So that basically it doesn't matter uh, in which map server the map request will land because the XTR will always use incremental nonces. So uh, it will always uh, send a, a nonce bigger than the previous one, uh, which that means may mean 
that you will see some gaps uh, or the map server will see some gaps if, if you have, let's say, three total three map servers in the in the deployment uh, and the map uh, requests are spread across, across the, the three. So maybe you will see gaps as a map server because some map requests landed in different uh, map servers and not in you, but still the nonce will be bigger than the last one you saw for a given XDR. So I don't know, I would like to, to hear if anyone has some comments on, on this issue. I have a comment, um, Albert. Um, the ITR does know the map server that the map request went to because it gets a map notify from them. So it has the source IP address from the map notify to know the map server. Yeah, so but it needs to know it, it does know the map it... server, but the problem is is that it has to now store a nonce per map server it's ever going to use. And that's not probably going to be very scalable. No, but even before that, Dino, bef when, when you send the map request to subscribe, you don't know yet your map server. So once you get the map notify back, you know it. But before you don't know it, right? Because you're sending the number the map request. Yeah, yeah your map resolver. understand, but when you send a map request, you pick a random number as the nonce, right? And because um, you, you have to, right? And then when you get a reply back, then you have to know that any subsequent um, map requests that are sent to that map server have to be incremented, but it won't scale. So it's not, a, it's, you know, we're trapped either way. If the, yeah, I mean, so you will, the very first, okay, the very first map request, Will be random, but then the rest, no, but again, because you, you need to, so let's say you need to send two map requests, right? You want to subscribe to two prefixes. And and those two prefixes happen to be on the same map server, but you don't know that, right? So you send a map request for the first prefix with a random nonce. You get the map notify back, it, it's all good. Now you need to send the second map request for the second prefix, which you don't know that is on the same map server. Which well, nonce? That's, ran you that's random too. The incremental nonce has to be per, Per prefix per map server. Okay. Which adds, it adds another factor to the scaling problem. Okay, that okay, that I agree. It needs to be if you want to do what you're suggesting per prefix per uh, map server. Yeah. Oh, I'm certainly and not agree. suggesting it. I'm saying to get it to work, that to get an incremental nonce to work, that's what you would have to do, which is non scalable. So we should look think of another way. That's why it's we're... not scalable. Why is not scalable? Just because you need to keep track of the uh, of who was the number of map servers times the number of prefixes that you're ever going to send a map request to over time. I mean, you you have to keep state because you you somebody uh, ask it to subscribe to something. That state you 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 you. That's you the state you know. of the server, not in the ITR. We know the map server has to store a lot of state because it has to um, send map notifies to everybody who's interested in the R load set change. But the ITR now has to keep state for all the map servers. And we've never had to do that before. An XTR would only have to know, know about two or four map servers just to send registrations and only know a map resolver for all the map requests it would ever have to send. Now it has to keep track of all the map servers. And since it's sending map requests for various EIDs, there could be thousands uh, of map servers that it has to, to do to store. Yeah, but at the same time, if you, okay. if you share the nodes across map servers, then you, you have a synchronization problem. It is not much easier. Hmm. Why do you have a synchronization problem, Luigi? I mean, I mean as long as the nodes is bigger. You, you have to synchronize state you know, among servers, right? But no, you don't. No, so the problem, the problem of having a single nonce for all the map servers is that you run out of nonce sooner, if that may be a problem eventually. But the nonce will be always be bigger, right? So you don't need to sync anything. You just need to check that it's bigger than the previous one you've seen. Map server basically will receive a larger nonce, uh, probably not in sequence. If let's say a lot of requests that go to one map server, uh, that will increase. But when you go to the other one, uh, that map server will receive uh, after a big hole and a value that is still incremental. We need to be careful because uh, I think there are attacks that can be done uh, uh, taking the map requests that are going to one map server and replying to the other map server. So, but I mean, if it's yeah. possible that at the end of the global state is not. Uh, 
is not really compromised, but we need to think a little bit through the, the solution. But I, I hope that uh, we can do it without synchronizing the state across the across the map server. That is my point. To to synchronize state uh, across map servers, then you you have a synchronization problem and yeah. a, a, a new vector of, of attack. So I would rather um, avoid that. Yeah, Albert, um, there is another solution in my ECD DSA draft where we sign map requests and and um and map registers you could use that in the map request and then what happens is you authenticate the source right and the map server could do all that yeah the cost of uh, introducing digital signatures we can uh, the, pub, the public key is already stored in the mapping system and the the, the map server all it has to do is look up the public key and verify the signature Right. There is still, even if we use digital signature to authenticate a map request, I think we might still have the problem of the reply attack. Because even if the request is signed, it will be properly signed. But, uh, uh, but I mean, if I reply that yeah, signing the request. If you replay with the same signature, you, you need a changing value in the packet is what you're saying, or, you, or it's not, it won't. Well, I mean, the, the reply attack is reusing something, right? If it is signed or not, it doesn't make, I mean, it make a difference, but from the reply attack perspective, yeah, it might right. not be yeah. what you need. Yeah. Agree, agree. So I, yeah, I think we are down to two trade-offs that is keeping more state on the, on the XDR or using this global nonce that has its own implications, so. Then we have another small issue. I mean, if we, I mean, uh, unless I misunderstood, if we have to keep state in the XTR, it means we have to change the way the XTR works or not. Yeah. Uh, Luigi, this is Fabio. We don't want to get there. I mean, <laughs> I think we understand the problem of synchronizing state across multiple uh, distributed entities, and we are trying to avoid to get there. So, yeah. I agree with what, all what you're saying about how bad it is to synchronize data across map servers. I, the, the point is, I mean, of the, having this discussion here is that, I mean, we, we are pointing out to the issues and uh, we understand that there are, there are open problems. It's very good to have this kind of conversation. Uh, I think, you know, going in the direction of trying to synchronize is not a, a, a goal of the design at this point. Okay, then, and the very last point is just really quick is I would like to 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 think you guys and to understand um, what do you think about unsolicited so subscription? That means when an XTR um, out of the blue receives a map notified as a pub sub, uh, so as a as a publication, and uh, and then it uses it to update its state without prior sending a map request to subscribe. So is that something, uh, I mean, it, it can be supported, uh, but do, do we want to, or, or would the working group prefer to, to always have the map request, map notify exchange, and then the, the regular publication operation? I, I have two, two, two comments or questions. Well, one is, what is the use case of this? And the second one, how you secure this or trust this? Uh, that, those are very good by unsolicited. So, what do you mean by unsolicited subscriptions? That doesn't make sense to me. That is when you, the map server, subscribe an XTR without the XTR uh, asking for it. And the case can be, for instance, uh, when you have a, an, an ELP, a specific locator path, and you know that some uh, hops are going to be traversed by a packet, but the hops don't know it yet. The map server knows it. So it may proactively send the the publication to them, so they have the state before the packets arrive. That's a use case. Uh, but then I the, remember the aspect. Yeah, the security aspect is is tricky here. You need to have either pre-share keys explicitly, so it will be for for deployments where you know you you put pre-share keys everywhere, and and then you need also to to realize that you need to have incremental nonsense as well. So basically, 
it, it shifts who start the nonce because in the in the regular operation the A state is the one that picks the nonce and then it's used uh, incrementally through the process. In in here is the map server the one that picks the nonce and then in, increments over the process. So. Well, an ELP change is definitely an hour log set change. And you would think that the ITR should want to ask for that, or otherwise it shouldn't be notified. Because then you're going to get these notifications you don't want. And who knows where the ITR is located, may not be able to have enough bandwidth or CPU power to, to do it. And it's, it's a DOS attack waiting to happen by a road map server. So for that use case, you should still require solicited subscriptions. I think that if we have a rock map server, we have bigger problems than this, probably. Um, yeah, but I don't know. Anybody, like to... anybody could spoof a packet, right? That's that's what you're trying to solve here, right? I don't understand is if the, the benefits outweigh the, the issues. Um, Remember, the, the ITR doesn't keep track of map servers. So if it receives a map notify from anybody, it could assume it's in a legitimate map server and try to run the protocol against it where it could maybe not be legitimate. No, because the, the map notify will be authenticated, right? So you will need to have some preset key. So, so Alberto, this is Victor. Uh, the advantage in the use case is that you would pre-provision the locator path. Is that is that what you're after? Like avoiding, say, if you have four stops in that locator path, you avoid having to wait for four resolutions. That's that's right, Victor. Yeah. Because you have this serial problem of packet drops, right? Yeah, exactly. This map is related to a prefix, right? So the 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 the, the RTR can still s subscribe uh, to to the prefix and say. Uh, if you have a request, just, just tell me or something like that. Uh, but they don't know in advance, right? So they, they know once they receive the, the data packet. And then you know, they, they, they nice. know they are in the path. Or not. Do, do they? Maybe, maybe they know because some configuration, but not, not I mean, I don't think we they can know assume they're that. They're in the path from the ELP because they're listed in the ELP. But if they don't have the ELP cached, and they receive a packet because the the previous hop knows about them. Then they get a packet, and then they have to do an EID lookup. And in the meantime, they're dropping packets. I guess my my question is: Is it okay for the working group to 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 state this? Um, I mean, saying that if if we want to support uh, this kind of behavior, then the the requirements are this and that, and they are going to be a strong requirement, like having a preset key across all entities. So this may not work in all scenarios. Would the working group be fine with that or? Saying that unsolicited subscriptions could happen in a well-controlled environment, and then you don't have security concerns? Because you have preset keys all over. I think if it's a well-controlled environment and you don't want to drop packets and the map server is part of the well-controlled environment, then sending these map notifies to each hop before they get the packets is a useful thing, right? I agree. Okay, fair enough then. That's, that's, that's it for pops up. Okay. Any more questions or comments? Otherwise, we we quickly go to wire guard. Okay. No more questions or comments. So, Albert, how many Albert did we have? <laughs> we have not enough. Not enough Albert. <laughs> we need more Alberts to solve the problems. Uh, more Alberts. <laughs>
Okay, I have the board, right? Yes, it says you do. Waiting to see your slides. Yeah, one second. Hello? Sorry, my, my, my WebEx just crashed. We can hear you. Yeah. Uh, I do have the ball already. You appear to. Okay, now, yeah, now I can see my slides. Yeah, you have it. Okay, can you see my slides now? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry for the. Okay, so um, I'm going to discuss the work that we have done um, on Lisp plus WireGuard. Um, this has been done by Alejandro, who is uh, also connected here, uh, Albert Lopez, Jordi, and, and myself. So all the co-authors are here, so we will be happy to, to take any questions. And this is rather an academic work, and the main idea is to, to try to trigger some discussions on what we have learned from WireGuard uh, and what we have learned from WireGuard when applied to, to Lisp. So the main motivation is to try to rethink the Lisp security architecture from a, let's say, clean slate standpoint, and, and try to think about only to secure popular use cases, uh, and not, not the entire Lisp architecture, meaning a multi uh, distributed mapping system deployment and so on, but rather maybe just one mapping, one mapping system, a simpler deployment. And the main inspiration behind this is, is WireGuard. So in this talk, I will basically discuss what is WireGuard, a super brief introduction, then what we have done, and then some implementation and performance analysis, and finally, the, the discussion. So what is WireGuard? So um, I apologize for those of you that, that you already know. I will try to go quickly through those slides. So WireGuard is basically a secure network tunnel, which is a, basically a VPN. It's, it has been merged onto the, into the Linux kernel, so it, it's, a, it's part of the main mainstream Linux kernel. And its design principles are quite interesting if you read the white paper that it's 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 um written on them it's um, at the bottom of the slides so basically what they say is so they are entering into a quite crowded space which is vpn right and they say okay let's take a look at traditional solutions such as ipsec and and, and Nike. and they say basically they support a very large set of cipher suites and key exchange mechanisms and they separate exchange layer from encrypted transfer, right? And although this is academically a sound uh, approach to this, uh, the result of the whole architecture is super complex because you support many different security mechanisms, which means that this needs, this needs to be negotiated. The code is super complex. This is prone to errors. It is harder to perform a, a, a sound security audit uh, and so on. So what they say is, um, we will try to do something which is way less flexible. They are not aiming for flexibility, but rather for simplicity. So they try to drop as many things as possible to keep it extremely simple and have a super small code, which is simpler, simpler to manage and to, to audit. So this is how uh, WireGuard go, uh, works. Basically, it's a virtual interface that you uh, bring up as a standard interface in, in Linux and you can add uh, an IP address, which they don't call it this way, of course, but we can assume that it's equivalent to what we call an EID. Uh, and then you, you add some uh, routes and so on. And this is the, 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 how the interface, the WireGuard interface looks. Then you have to apply the security configuration, which I will discuss later. And uh, once you apply security configuration, you end up with something like this, uh, peers, Basically, you have the, pub, the public key of your interface, your local public key, the private key of your interface, the listening port, which is equivalent to our uh, list port, 
And then for each peer with, with which you will communicate, you have to uh, configure the public key of that peer and then the allowed IPs, which is equivalent to the EIDs for that peers that you will accept from them, and the endpoint. The endpoint, you don't configure it. This is discovered automatically, and the endpoint is equivalent to the, to the locator. So uh, the worker interface, it has what they call a crypto key routing, which is basically each peer is identified by the public key. And then once the peer has been identified by the public key, the packet is encrypted uh, and routed to the endpoint of that peer, which is the, loca the locator. And using as the um, as in the data packet, the EIDs for the local peer and the destination peer. So uh, just finishing with, with Bergard, um, the uh, it's quite important to understand that the, the key distribution that they are aiming for, so how do you deploy the public keys on the peers is equivalent to open SSH, open SSH meaning that you just use an out of band exchange mechanism to configure a static public keys between the peers. So you uh, send it by email or, or you secure copy them or whatever you want, but they don't provide any sort of mechanism for that. But at the same time, it's super easy. Once you have the key, you just configure it and that's it. Exactly the same as SSH. As I was saying before, WireGuard does not have this traditional approach to cipher suites and, and protocol agility, meaning that WireGuard does not have to negotiate which is the appropriate security mechanism that they will use among the ones supported by the peers, but rather only supports a very uh, small set of cipher suites. And, and if you want to change that, basically you need to do a software update on the WireGuard node. So it's more like a DevOps approach rather than a, a, security, a traditional security approach. And most importantly, I guess for us, is that then once you have this done, everything else happens below the WireGuard interface, the administrator does not have to care about anything, meaning that the key session exchange, connection, disconnection, reconnection, discovery of the new mapping, if the mobile, if the node has moved, the new endpoint, uh, and, and everything else happens uh, uh, be below the WireGuard interface, and you don't have to do anything, so there is no kind of work to do at the control plane. And this means that while uh, WireGuard natively supports layer 3 mobility without uh, any kind of uh, notification, such as SMR, or a rendezvous server, such as a home agent. They don't need any kind of messaging like this one, because once you have an authenticated packet from your peer, you don't care about the new, you, you already, you will trust the new uh, airlock that uh, it is using. And that's one of the main, I, I would say, architectural advantages from our perspective. So, so Albert, does it glean the source information because it could be trusted? When it changes, it's trusted because it is encrypted by the peer and verified by the public key that you have configured locally. Okay, but it means the other side has to speak before it moves, right? No, or it can speak after it moves. It doesn't matter. If it moves, if it moves and it doesn't speak, how will I know about the new Arlo? No, then it doesn't work. Okay, that's what I was asking. Good, good point. And it doesn't work neither if there is a double jump. For instance, two mobile nodes, they, they double jump, meaning that they won't find each other. They will never find each other. But, and this is if each side of a connection moves. Yeah, that's exactly. Okay. okay. Yeah. But, but, uh, and that's uh, an important, uh, that's my, 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 my personal uh, understanding, okay? It's not written by the, on the, on the Wargard white paper. But I will say that they don't care about this use case because it's super complex to solve and it's extremely rare. So they prefer not to address it uh, and rather to have a, a simple architecture. I, I, I will say that that's the, the, the main philosophy behind WireGuard and, and for this particular use case. But it's true. It's true. Um, so what we have done is we have tried to uh, design this least security architecture um, using WireGuard. So what we have done is, so let's say that um, the host on the left wants to communicate with the host on the right. So the first thing it will happen is that the host on the, on the right will map register the EID to airlock mapping plus the public key for that endpoint. So that's the first step. We are assuming one single map server map is over the point. Then, as in, as in the standard list, the host on the left will map request for that EID 
and in turn the map reply will contain the public key for that host okay so it will be able to configure locally the the worker interface but the, the the main difference is the fourth method that now we have introduced a map notify that is sent from the map server to the destination peer including the the public key of the source of the source node because you cannot receive packets if you don't have the key of the of the source node that's why you need to push you need to push the public key of the source node to the destination node otherwise the destination node will not be able to receive any packets okay so once this is done then the worker channel can be established and in order to secure the whole thing it's super simple what we have done is we also use a worker channel between the XTRs or mobile nodes and the map server map resolver which means that fundamentally in order to so with the standard work done, you need to configure you need to pre-configure all the public keys for all the nodes with which you are going to communicate now with with list you just need to configure the public key of the map server and through that public key you will retrieve the public keys of the peers with which you want to communicate okay so it's okay. a super yeah quick question so when at time number one when when that node xtrb registers it's going to get a notify for all the other nodes that have registered with that map server is that what you're saying no you will only get notified if the map server receives a map request address it to you oh later so one two three so the the notify at number four goes goes to um only oh it doesn't fan out it just goes to the request okay got it so and the, it's, the, assuming, it's assuming it wants bi-directional communication right always yeah yeah so basically here the map request is signaling to whom i want to communicate and the map server will push the key of the source node to that destination node yeah is it clear uh, yes is that a traditional map notify message I believe, I believe that so we prototyped this and we try to be as fast as possible i think we use the traditional map notify message but maybe we cut some corners but it's no it certainly can work because you just put a mapping record in there with an rloc that contains the public key so yeah, we use the security lcap for to transport the keys and it was super simple this was simple yeah. sounds good okay so um uh, but that's the key take takeaway. You only need to configure on your XTRs the public key of the uh, map server, and that's it. And once you have the, those, this key, you will be able to communicate with anyone. So we did an implementation um, on uh, Open Overlay Router, and we basically we configure the WireGuard interface using uh, the WireGuard uh, API. Actually, we have two WireGuard interface, one to communicate with the peers, and another one to communicate with your map server, map server. Uh, yeah. No questions? Okay. There's a question. Prakash, did you get to ask your question? Yes. Uh, I have a question on the previous slide, uh, Albert. Sure. How the keys are uh, refreshed if if they, uh, they need to. Do we have the dual keys or? So there are two, dual keys? two types of keys. So the, the public keys, in order to refresh them, you will configure, you will map register new keys. And that's it. And then the session keys that are actually used for WireGuard uh, encryption are refreshed by WireGuard. But like, uh, if there is only one key and refreshing will take time, in between we have some uh, time gap, right? So if you map register a new key, yeah, uh, the, the WireGuard connection will drop and will have to be resumed. But you Typically, I, I'm not I, I I'm not an expert on that, but typically you have to refresh this kind the, the public key in that, that scenario. You have to refresh it. I will say in probably Fabio knows more about this, but I will say weeks, months. So it's not a super uh, like MagSec and those kind of things. We they keep like multiple keys, so uh, the other key can be used while the other is getting refreshed. I'm wondering like is there a same mechanism here, or it's only one single key here? It's one single key. We didn't prototype or architect anything related to refreshing the keys. For us, refreshing the keys is as simple as sending an in-map register, and it is true that you will drop the current if you have a worker connection. But my understanding is that simply you, you have could, the same. You could put multiple public keys in different RLOC records 
and then you can solve the problem, right? Yeah, I think that's something like that will be needed because you need to have the other key ready. Uh, means we cannot register another one. Uh, means like one X wire and then register another one. But but please uh, recall that the WireGuard channel is not encrypted using that that key. So it is encrypted using using a session key. That session key is derived from the public key, and that session key is refreshed quite often. Yes, but if you lose the private key, you have to register a new public key. Right. Yeah, yeah, but that is it is Fabio. This is the that is the assumption of WireGuard, right? So you have. Uh, uh, basically, a distribution of uh, of the public key that is the source of trust again. So, and there is a so session. Not as, so, what you're saying, both of you are saying, it's it's not as dynamic because you could renegotiate a session key at any time. So, if you want to do fast keying for cash, you do it with the with the, a new session key, right? Which is automatically done by WireGuard already. Yeah, right. Where these keys are only used. The, the um, asymmetric keys are only used um, and re or rekeyed only when um, you lose a private key, right? And that doesn't happen as often if it's protected. Exactly. So, yeah, that's the point. Yeah. Or I think that there are some security policies where you have to refresh your keys each month or years. I don't know exactly, but it is not certainly a, a, a very often. It's the same model of OpenSSH, right? You refresh your public key. I mean. Sure that by each of our companies as a policy and you need to refresh it every six months or whatever it is right um, yeah uh, means, uh, i don't have a full context of uh, how it uh, this wire guard work but i was just comparing with the maxsec and uh, we keep the multiple key because we don't uh, let the other key expire uh, uh, and then so in, that, uh, in that case uh, i think the the the, the wired guard public key is similar to the maxsec uh, certificate i think no so, in maxsec there are multiple encryption keys that you use there so there's symmetric keys uh, but 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 they are all derived, right? I don't, I don't remember. It has been some time since I looked at Master last time. Yeah, I mean, uh, so just kind of uh, uh, indicating that we can take the discussion uh, further. If it's already there, uh, that's fine. I just wanted to, because I think this I see in the general map server uh, communication as well. If let's say we need to renegotiate the key, that is like a kind of uh, uh, takes some time, and especially when the uh, the deployment has a lot of XTRs. And everybody has to uh, uh, do that. That takes time. So there, it's just a thought uh, we can discuss. Right. Okay. Thanks for 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 the question. So um, I will continue. Um, Is it okay if I respond to Prakash? The, EC, no. the ECDSA draft allows you to um, register public. You, you can use the authentication key as we have it now, but that just gives you authorization to register within an instance ID. If you want to not allow individual XTRs to register, then you just remove their public key from the mapping system and then their map registers will get, and map requests will get rejected. So that's how you can scalably change keys or disallow and reallow new XTRs into the mapping system, Prakash. And this draft is, uh, can, can you just repeat the name, ECD? The, uh... It's the ECDSA auth draft. It's a working group draft. Okay, I'll, I'll look into that. Thanks. Maybe that's the one uh, I was trying to point out. Okay. So we prototype this architecture and, uh, in OpenOverlay router. Um, we basically configure the two WireGuard interfaces because one is for the map, map server map resolver and the other one is for field communication. Uh, mappings are only needed for the first connection. Because afterwards, uh, WireGuard will take care of the new EID to error mapping for that peer. Uh, meaning that even if one peer handovers or um, or changes the or changes for whatever reason the airlock, there is no control, there is no list control plane uh, message required because WireGuard will take care of that. And we we when we prototyped this, we decided not to not to change anything on the WireGuard kernel module. Well, one of the reasons why is because it's super complex and, and because maybe it doesn't make sense architecturally. 
uh, which means that there is no support for multi-homing, no support for instance IDs, and uh, no support for distributed mapping, uh, map, 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 mapping system. We can discuss this later. And here you have uh, how it looks like. Because um, once you drop support for instance ID, because at this point we, we couldn't uh, make it happen, uh, maybe for an next iteration of this prototype, this means that we don't use the list encapsulation. We just use the wireguard encapsulation because that's enough for us. Okay, so just uh, super quickly on performance, and I think that that's, that you will see that one of the plots, I believe it's quite relevant. So this is the CDF of uh, red standard double OR and blue wireguard plus double OR uh, for the end-to-end -end latency, meaning all the, catch, all the catch are empty, and then you have to uh, map request, map reply, send them, map notify, send the packet, and uh, the latency goes until the first packet arrives. And the, 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 cool, the cool thing here is that the difference between the two is just one millisecond on average. Okay, so, so it's a quite good overhead for the, for, in order to obtain the benefit of, of, of the key. And the one which is, I will say, most impressive to me is this one. This is the handover latency between uh, WireGuard and WR, WireGuard plus WR and WR, which means that here we are comparing, okay, we have a mobile node and either we switch to a new, uh, so we turn off the Wi-Fi and we switch to a new Wi-Fi or we do a Wi-Fi to LTE. So, uh, and then you have to do the whole thing. So with a standard WR, which I will say is the standard list, uh, it, it took uh, on average eight, nine seconds. And with um, WireGuard, it only takes uh, around one one second and the reason is that you don't need to smr anyone you don't need rtrs you don't need any kind of control plane messaging you don't need any kind of airlock proving and that app, since data packets are authenticated you can glean the new uh, locator and send as fast as possible okay. so this last so, so can you uh... Okay, so the, the advantage is that because now you have an authentication authenticated link between the ITR and the ATR, you can uh, uh, rely on gleaning. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's a very strong conclusion. Very strong nice. Conclusion. So, so Alberto, this is Victor. Um, I don't know if you're still working on this or if it would be possible to do the same handover latency comparison with a an environment where you are actually using map notifications with PubSub. Because what, what we found is below the blue line uh, in our you know in our customer uh, experimentation when we use uh, PubSub and notify the uh, the ITRs of the move. So in, in absolute terms. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure that you can improve that with uh, better implementations and better hardware in absolute latency terms. But architecturally, I don't think that you can make it better because there is no signaling, right? Literally, zero signaling. Well, the difference no you is could do that better with signaling. That's my better. point. That's my point. Uh, if you, there's two ways to do this, right? One is to wait for the SMRs to get through and re-request your mappings and reconverge. That's our traditional mobility. Um, we can also subscribe as an ITR to any changes in that destination that is moving, and you would be notified immediately as soon as the registration happens. And yes, there is some signaling, but what we've observed is in the order of 20, 50 milliseconds. Or, um, or and But if and we followed the, the architecture, in the same, sorry, if we follow the architectural difference in OOR, maybe the red line is not below the blue line, but I, I'd be curious to see what that results in. But there's also predictive R loads and gleaning inside of LISP, regardless of wire guard, that are still faster than all the signaling solutions, right? Because it's data packets that are updating the information, right? This is a one RTT handover latency, basically, because you just need to send the next data packet, and that's it. So the, even the term handover latency doesn't make too much sense here. There is so uh, uh, so uh, although I I agree that you can improve uh, in many aspects, I don't see how you can uh, get better than that. So that's what I was doing in the list mobile node demos 
was that the RTRs were gleaning the information. So there was no NAT traversal um, control logic that needed to be done because the RTR was gleaning the source information. Of course, that wasn't secured and hence the concern, but here we have the security, which, which makes it a really good solution. Yeah, I want to make one comment. I mean, this is a great example of, uh, for once, security is not uh, uh, no making things worse. Yeah, exactly, but, uh, but <laughs> things matter. It's, it's, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, and, and that's a very, a very good comment because it's not only making things faster, but also making things easier because it's no control-based signaling at all. You don't have to, to think about pops up, SMR, nothing. It doesn't matter. Because well, well, the I mean, if, if you look at, at the history, and here we are both friends, right? Uh, uh, Dino had this original vision, right, of relying a lot into gleaning uh, for Lisp. And basically that vision was beaten out of Lisp because of security. And if we can bring right. it back by using, uh, by using uh, you know, something like this, that's pretty cool. I agree 100%. In fact, I think we should write a simple internet draft that describes the map notify advertising public keys, and then we can use the gleaning approach and have fast handoffs. I, I, I mean, I don't know if you had plans to do that, but we could do this in list proper by distributing the public keys. And you, you know what you've just done is you built even a better decentralized mapping system because there is now mapping system, right? Only, for, only to retrieve the, the key for the first time, and then that's it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Oh, right. Oh, to bootstrap the whole process. Or to bootstrap, but after right. that you don't need you don't need it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. That is a nice context as a context as a concept as well, right? I mean the fact that you use a traditional mapping system, and then you bootstrap an infrastructure that uh, has a set of properties that are uh, nice. So and that's what the blockchain yeah. world does. They have seeds that bootstrap peer-to-peer -peer communication. So it, it's the same idea. So it's, it's, the, it's, um, it's, it's yet another way of doing decentralization. Yeah. So is there space to define uh, the equivalent wired guard functionality natively in Lisp so that, so that it's not list plus something but it's inherent to list in a secure mode so in, in in this case we don't use list in data plane we only use, use wide guard and what we are missing from list i would say the most important feature is instance id so if um what um and one of the uh, discussion items was how we could introduce instance id in this architecture so the answer to your question is yes, but to me, this is already WireGuard, right? So this is WireGuard plus instance ID. Or are we missing any other feature of the data plane Lisp encapsulation? Yeah, so, well, I, I will make it here. Um, yeah, I, I would say, um, especially related to this slide you're showing, um, multi-homing, would also be a challenge, right? In, in combination yeah. with yeah. with gleaning. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Fully agree. Those are the two features which are not supported by this prototype and which by far are most relevant. Are the most relevant. So How let, let me just put... and not traversal. Yeah, no not traversal too. Yeah. Right. Open uh, the up on, I think there's a big menu, that's why I'm thinking if we could incorporate those mechanisms in list. Maybe maybe that's one path uh, to to research and, and explore. There is uh, there is another aspect I would like to to highlight uh, from another, on, on the trade offs that we are making because this is a this is a, an excellent result and, and and I love what you guys have done. And another thing that this on, on the other hand another thing that this uh, complicates is the uh, forwarding of uh, data packets. So and we rely on that a lot in 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 mobility today, right? In in Lisp. In, in EAD mobility, and, and Mark can comment probably on that since he's had an author of the draft. Um, but here, if you are an old IP for a given EAD, right, an, an old an old airlock for a given EAD, and you receive a packet, it's really hard for you to forward it to the to the new airlock because you need to establish the the new security association and, and all that. Meanwhile, in vanilla list, you can just forward it, and that's it. I'm not saying that you know this has a so we stop it for this, but you know, it has some trade-offs that, that we need to consider. Yeah, I, I fully agree. So let me jump because this is literally my, my last slide. 
So, um, and I think that many of the questions that, that you, you guys were asking are pretty much uh, uh, somehow here. Uh, but this work is basically can be understood as two different things. So first is a list circuit architecture, but it, it is also a control plane for wireguard. So the same work can be understood in two different ways. Uh, as I was saying, it does not support multi-homing, it does not support instance IV, and it does not support the distributed mapping system. But, and that's my personal uh, opinion. I think that what, what at least by doing this work with Alejandro and Albert, we have learned is that maybe if, if you narrow down the use cases uh, or you simplify a little bit what you really want to achieve, it's, it's easier to come up with the architecture. So let's say the, the unique, uh, the unique ask. So if one node, the fact that you don't have a full duplex communication, it complicates things a lot. Let's assume that you always have full duplex and, and that's it because things are way easier. Or this is super simple when you have one single map server map resolver. Once you start having a distributed map server map resolver, then everything is super complicated. Probably most of the use cases uh, today in Lisp are deployed with just one single map server map resolver. So correct me if I'm, I'm wrong with that. But what I'm saying is that by assuming something, everything else gets super simple. And maybe we could also try to target those kind of scenarios and not support all the features and all the scenarios all the time. So that's it for my presentation. That's a big lesson, this Fabio. Uh, I mean, that's basically the main lesson of Varga, right? While uh, we have been busy in ITF uh, for many, many years, right, in all the possible options of security. Uh, basically, this group came up and said, well, I mean, we really need to just establish a security association. That's an easy way to do it. Sure, there are there is a list of features that we cannot match with that, but it serves quite a lot of use cases, right? So, yeah, yeah, this is Victor. So I think definitely something to to pursue further. I, one big difference is how much do you do on the host versus how much do you need to do on network devices. I think that's where uh, that's where things get a little ugly for us from a you know multi homing and other perspectives. Um, to, interestingly enough, your your second to last bullet uh, was exactly what, and, and I think we've run out of time. But what I was intending to to discuss today was the need for a distributed mapping system from the uh, civil aviation organization. Um, so you know, it it doesn't mean that in every system we have to do that. But ironically, this is a system where. Uh, a good scalable and fast mobility solution would be extremely welcome because it's about connecting airplanes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, good point. But it's it's distributed and it's distributed across governments and countries and you know, uh, it's it's a complicated beast. But, yeah, but this is really. You're cool. still going to give your presentation. Um, I'm willing to stay if others can, and if others can't, they could drop off. I, I can make it at least. Luigi, you're cold. I mean, we are over time, but if you're willing to keep chairing this, I'm willing to let yeah. it run. I would no problem. Let let it run. If people have other commitments, certainly they can top out. Uh, like somebody else needs the room. <laughs> And Victor uh, will stick around and do the presentation. <laughs> I do want to say, since I complained to folks on the list, I really appreciate the engagement and discussion we're seeing here. This is what it's for. <laughs> yeah, that's, and, and it's also the other uh, thing that is interesting, Joel, is totally second what you're saying, is that uh, the, the the virtual thing is not hampering the discussion a lot. I mean, we're being able to, I think, bring on different perspective, different point of view, and these things works. So it's the minute taker will be dropping off, but and that's fair. So Padma, just note in the minutes that that he's presenting the last one over time, and don't worry about capturing anything more. Thank you. Thanks, Padma. Hi, this is Jordi. I can volunteer to take minutes for the rest of the of the meeting if you want. Oh, that would be great. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Welcome. Bye. Bye, Padma. Bye, Padma. Okay. So uh, I guess we have.
there are no further comments on the fire guard and list. Okay, so we give I just had one quick question for Albert. Um, are you are you going to donate the code into WireGuard's open source? Yeah. Think, uh, yeah. It's, it's a prototype code, but yeah, definitely. I'll give the, the ball to Victor. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit of, about um, Mapping System Federation. It, it came about in the context of an overlay application. So that's how it uh, maps to the overlay discussion. So. Um, I'll do a quick ground-based Lisp refresher. This was the um, design uh, based on Uberlay that was put together for the Civil Aviation Organization Network, uh, which triggered uh, the thought on these requirements. And then we'll talk about the um, requirements for federating a mapping system across multiple organizations. And, uh, you know, we can cap it at, at any time. I mean, this could roll on forever. So we're on a slippery slope by extending the time. So we could cap it at 20 minutes if that if that's okay. Um, and we'll see how far we get into the solutions discussed. But my, my goal, my main goal is to actually um, get people thinking about this because I, I think um, we will get better results by having everyone uh, put their heads to it and, and see what ideas come about in terms of creating these systems. So um, the, the problem that was being posed to us by the Civil Aviation Organization was that of their uh, global network for connecting um, the airplanes, right? And the airplanes are connected for several reasons. Some of it is traffic that goes back to the manufacturers. Some of, them, some of it is traffic that goes to air traffic control. Some of it is traffic that goes back to the airline. Um, and uh, they have these radio regions, which are all bespoke. They're either satellites or ground, uh, ground to sky links. And there's all sorts of different radio regions. And they're all interconnected by an IP network, right? And what we were, uh, what we were solving was the mobility within that IP network. And uh, it was mobility within an IP network that was built by different companies and different governments. Um, and I said East, West, South here, it's not really uh, a, a geographic uh, geographic uh, type service. Uh, sometimes you'd be in the same geography and you could be multi-home to, uh, to different providers. So this is more of a, an abstract view of things, but you could have Inmarsat and Viasat in, in the same region and you could connect or connect to both. So, so one of the big things was to solve uh, this multi-homing um, between two different regions, which resulted in basically multi-homing to two different providers in the LISP network. Um, and, and by the way, this inter-networking region is the area where LISP would be enabled. Uh, and the other problem was simply the, the moves across, right? So multi-homing and moves uh, were, were the thing that triggered the interest in, in LISP. Now, because these are handled by different organizations and different governments, there are different preferences in these. And um, some of these uh, organizations are very keen on using LISP. Some of them are very keen on using proxy mobile IP. And uh, that's still a matter of discussion. But the key thing is that um, we want to create a global network where there is mobility. Uh, preserved, and that's why we proposed the overlay model, where all of these different regions, whether they use LISP or something else, would actually meet in the overlay in the center, right? And uh, each provider would own and operate their own set of, in the case of LISP, XDRs, border, um, border RTRs, and map servers. In the case where it was proxy mobile IP, they would own their own components to a border uh, RTR or XTR in this case that actually fed into the overlay. So one, one of the things that, uh, that became evident uh, was that 
the um, the providers already have uh, peering agreements amongst each other, and um, those those have been heavily negotiated over time, right? and um, and that allows them to not have a third party broker the connectivity amongst them. And they want to move that forward. So there wasn't an environment where we could propose an overlay operator that owned a global mapping system and simply provided service to all of these. It was more of a requirement where the overlay portion of the network was uh, federated and you had a series of map servers. So if I, if I describe graphically what the environment is, um, it starts looking something like this. So if I go back to my west, east, and south analogy, uh, there's a series of radio regions connected to each one of them. The list network starts where uh, the air to ground routers are. Right? And there's also ground to ground routers connecting to data centers and um, control towers and things of that nature. But this would be um, this would be one service provider, another service provider, and they have established BGP peerings amongst them. Right? And that uh, there's contracts and everything is in place for, for that. That, in a way, is our underlay, and that's the way we've been looking at it. Um, and uh, for us to give the different um, providers a certain degree of independence in terms of what they did, we proposed the overlay so that they could combine different methods of using LISP or even have some islands that were not even using LISP. And, um, and that, uh, that model was proposed originally with a single um, mapping system, and therefore you could see that the question arose uh, in terms of who actually uh, manages this uh, this mapping system. So, fast forward, uh, the thing that made sense was that everybody had a presence. Every service provider would have a presence in the in that mapping system, and we have things like DDT that we could use to do this. Um, we, we could we could do this. In, I mean, in the early days, we, we did things with BGP amongst these. Um, but the, the problem that, uh, that we have and why this becomes hard is not just the fact that I want each one of these guys to own their, their mapping system presence in the overlay, um, but also the fact that these airplanes move from one region to another. And if the airplane moves into um, a different country or into a different provider, uh, they, they've been very clear that they want to preserve all the registrations for that airplane in the region. So their policy is uh, we are going to align location or attachment to the network with me being the authoritative uh, point of registration for this. And the, their understanding, uh, right or wrong, and we could provide some better guidance there, but. Uh, their understanding is that by owning the registration, they are in a position to also control the policies um, by which traffic is forwarded to and from that aircraft. There a quick question. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Last slide. If the, if the plane moves to a new region where the registration is preserved, does the authentication key change or does it stay the same? Um, it would it would have to stay the same, right? If you wanted seamless, uh, I, yeah, registration, right? Yeah, yeah. It has it has to be seamless. Um, but but that's a great question. I mean, a lot of a lot of the discussion around security with ICAO has been centered around um, encrypting all the messaging, um, and. Uh, they, they haven't really been concerned much about the authentication key. And I guess the assumption is that anybody playing in this field has has access to the info. Um, but yeah, it would have to be preserved. So, so one one of the things that I I would like people to think about is that this is not necessarily on a, a overlay specific problem. It came up in the context of an overlay application. Um, but in general, if you, if you simply think about those border or encapsulating tunnel routers that separate the sites from the overlay, um, those for the purposes of this federation are basically uh, XTRs. 
right? They will register, they will get notifications and so forth. So we can generalize the problem to simply a, um, a federation of mapping systems where mobility is, is supported and, and more importantly, where um, the, the policy for those uh, mappings um, would be controlled by the mapping system in the region you attach to. And it would also be subject to any peering agreements that there may be between the providers. So if there is a flow between the West uh, region, uh, an aircraft in the West region and a um, manufacturing facility that is in the South region, and there is a policy between the providers that are, that are supporting that connection, uh, or an, an agreement between them, then we should be able to honor that. And in order to honor that, we should be able to understand at resolution time uh, the source and destination points of the flow, right? So which uh, did the originating R look, was it in, in which region was it in? And the destination R look, which region was that in? So that we can then say, okay, yes, you are allowed to connect directly, or no, we should put, be putting you through an ELP. Um, different things that we could do, but that awareness is important. Um, and also, they are very uh, adamant about having the endpoints register with their resource, right? So there's those two things, and um, we're still working with them for to get more crisp definition of what those policies could be. Um, but uh, it was one of those things that when we, we shared in the room, well, maybe you can anchor all the Boeing aircraft to one um, to one mapping system and all the uh, Airbus aircraft to a different mapping system. They, they all, everybody lost it. They, it's, not, it's not how they operate. So, so this is, a, is in a way a summary of some of those requirements. So the EAD should be in full control of the SP they attach to. The, I think I've talked about that quite a bit. Um, we should support the peering agreements by different mechanisms. Uh, engineering paths or choosing specific um, re-encapsulating tunnel routers is the thing that occurs to me. Um, but there may even be uh, scenarios where you don't allow the communication. Um, the definition of the policy should be an autonomous process, meaning you, you own uh, you are in control, so you can guarantee to your local government, yes, I've enforced this policy all the way to our borders. And then if we went into another provider, they'll, they, I, I, I have compliance, I have ways to actually show that I am compliant. Right? Um, and, uh, and this gets complicated because, because of this ability to multi-home. So uh, an EID, um, and, and we're, we're fighting this battle with uh, ICAO, so that we can have um, different IP addresses as you connect into different radio networks. But so far, what they've expressed is they want a single IP address with some um, cost values or DSCP values associated with it. Um, and, uh, and that would basically mean that you are on, a, on aircraft one um, over radio network one versus aircraft one over radio network two will be the same IP address with a different DCP value. Um, we're trying to guide them to getting basically uh, different IP addresses because it does make things much easier uh, from the perspective of, of LISP and, and enforcing uh, policy on different mappings. Um, net net, uh, either way, uh, there will be a need to evaluate our ability to enforce policies and make decisions based on not just the destination EAD, but also evaluate the fact that a request may have come from a source in a particular region, which is defined by the R look of that, of that source request. Um, and also knowing that it's going to a particular destination, which is also defined by, a, by the R looks in that destination region. Okay, so those are some of the things to consider. Um, and we don't really have a good answer for this. So um, a few months back, I, um, Dino and I chatted about this very briefly. 
Um, we looked at a cash referral system, which I've documented here. Um, I had also thought about some enhancements in the signaling that are um, rather elaborate uh, and, and we can discuss. Um, Descent uh, may have some promise. Um, some of what Albert just described um, in terms of uh, what we do by sharing a key may actually may actually be useful. So there, it's it's. I'm basically trying to open this for discussion and, and consideration of the group, um, as a more as a problem statement than as a um, proposal for a solution. Although I, I do have some some thoughts on on things that we could do initially, um, and the I think one one key question to the group is um, does this is this problem clear enough? Uh, um, do you do you agree that it's a problem? Um, and and if so, should this be its own draft and its own work stream, or do we keep it as part of the overlay uh, draft? Well, the overlay draft is a solution um, to a problem. And this is describing a use case. Um, do you want it? Do you want to couple the solution and the use case, or you just want to define what the use case is and what parts of standard list can be used versus what new things need to be developed? I think the latter, right? I, I want to understand what I can use and and if there's any new development. So do you believe and, Uberlay is going to solve this use case problem? Or oh, my my the the reason for my question, uh, you know, is in in Uberlay we're talking about how do I concatenate a series of domains, right, and make that work and make that whole. The uh, specifics of how the um, the mapping system is implemented in each domain are left uh, open open ended. And the uh, uh, and the intent of the overlay is to clearly define the interfaces between these domains that may have different implementations of the mapping system. But the um, but to the me, mapping this particular yeah this to me this particular problem is is a, a a different way of designing the mapping system to cater for for those mobility events. But the site overlays the site overlays are running a mapping system according to the existing list protocols. So Correct. deployment options are different than protocol options, right? They don't have, they don't need any new mapping system features right. on the site overlays. And to connect right. the site overlay mapping systems together uses a draft of new technology called Uberlay, right? Yeah. So I don't, um, I don't see anything that you've presented here that's new that's different than Uberlay, right? Or unless you just want to document what the use case is and show that each one of these four three bullets here can also be used as alternatives to Uberlay. Is that what you're considering? Well, no, I'm saying that's options to consider. I mean, these are options to evaluate, and some of them don't meet the requirements, right? So, for instance, the cash referral system, if I went through it, uh, you'll see that the that the registration of, let's go through an example, right? But uh, the registration, I've got boys and girls, right? And um, and all ladies will be registered to the West mapping system and all boys will be registered to the South mapping system. So if you were to think of uh, the girls mapping system as Inmarsat and the boys mapping system as Viasat, we basically didn't meet the requirement, which was I, I want anybody who attaches to my region to be registered with me. And in this case, we would be basically um, having, for instance, Paul moves to a different region. He still is registered with his original mapping system. I'm sorry, I jumped through this very quickly, but. So, so it's an interesting problem. <laughs> What's that? It's an interesting That's problem because the, so far we we only looked 
a defected um, uh, and it, a device moves and is attached behind different XDRs, but still registers to, to, to the same mapping system, mapping server right, right. at the end. Right. Now you want to change where you register and the register from the other, I suppose. Yeah, that's that's well, correct. So either either we change where we register or we provide enough mechanisms to guarantee that the the hosting uh, environment can enforce their policies on those on those uh, on those map resolutions when required. So Victor, so I mean, Joe made this comment uh, many ITFs ago. Um, you can. You can have the mobility and register to the same map servers and you can still get independence because each of the regions can consider can configure the map servers and operate the map servers independently with their own policy so he was questioning and i am now is why is uberlay providing anything different because you will then have this cost of um, registering to a different ip address when you change regions with this new map server, that's Luigi's comment. And the fact that something, that's why I asked you the question, does the authentication key have to change? And you said no, because you wanna minimize the number of changes as the plane moves from one site overlay to another site overlay, but it's gonna to have to register to a new IP address because the map server address isn't gonna be the same, right? You're not using local addressing or scoped addressing or anything like that. So right. I, I don't see why, I mean, DDT was designed to have hierarchy and multiple um, administrations able to organize and manage it. So why do you think that doesn't work? And why do you need um, a mapping system to connect mapping systems? Um, not really need a mapping system to connect mapping systems. I just need to make sure that whoever owns East, and if those mechanisms are already in place, then, um, then I just need Three, to understand. An open lake connects mapping systems? They do. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, an overlay connects mapping systems, and that's for for other reasons, right? But then once you get to the overlay itself, right, the structure of the mapping system within the overlay, uh, do I have what I need to make sure that if Paul is uh, connected on the east side, it is the east side that is defining what policies Paul would be subject to? If Paul was no registered, but if Paul was registered to the same map server, and no matter where he moved, he would always have his policies maintained because it stays in one place. Luigi's comment. Kind of. Right? The policy changes, right? As you go from one provider to another, your policy will change. Isn't the policy based on what's moving, not who's providing the service? It's based on who's providing the service. That's the difference. That's, that means the that's service the is going to change. Challenge. The service is going to change for the airplane as it moves. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Yeah. Be more specific. Um, Don't worry. You there... will continue to fly, Dino. <laughs> Be scared. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, social distancing is different depending on the provider you're on, right? <laughs> No, not the flight service, you know, it's the communication service. Yeah, right? yeah I, I understand. I was joking. With uh, priorities, um, you know, how you routed, are you put through firewalls, are you allowed to get certain places or not? Right? There are common resources uh, on ground that may be off limits in certain geographies, maybe off limits through certain networks. Um, so if you so were connecting- When the plane moves, when the plane knows it enters a new region, it clears its map cache. And then when it starts needing to talk to new places, it sends map requests that apply those policies. And then it decides how its map cache gets populated. So it knows who's it's allowed to talk to and who it's not allowed to talk to, right? Yeah, and that's all defined by the, the network it's attaching to. Right? And that's the control they want. Uh, if we don't have to have the um, the airplane explicitly register with 
the mapping systems that are controlled by that provider, that's fine, as long as we can show a way to enforce the oh, policy. That, that's an important point you just made. That means it's not required to be the provider that's giving you the under doesn't have to control the mapping system. So you don't, you're saying it, it doesn't need to be in that site overlay, which is good. That simplifies things. No, it needs to be in the site over. So I, I tried to simplify the graphs. This is the overlay only. Between Paul and XTRE is an entire LISP network, which is a site overlay for that provider. Um, so, so the, the point here, and that network may not be LISP, you know, by the way, it may be proxy mobile IP. But the, the core where they all meet is, is a LISP network. So, so the, the point is, if the East provider can guarantee, if we can guarantee to this provider unequivocally that when somebody connects to their network, even if they continue to register with somebody else's map system, they do it through our through their East infrastructure and the East infrastructure is in a position to enforce their policies then problem solved. I, I don't need to take over you, the registration. I just don't know how you do that without taking over the registration. Deep dive into what it what do you mean exactly when Paul moves and it registers to another mapping system? Is it is he registering to a map server that's in the other site overlay or the what, what do you mean? Explain more of that. Yeah so he, he registers to another site overlay, right? And that registration in that other site overlay. The new one or the old one? The new one. Okay, you, you said other, so um, I don't have any reference. Um, sorry, um, let me find. Uh, so, so this is the complete diagram, right? <clears throat> and all I did was attempt to simplify it, but I don't have Paul here, but Paul would move from the south side to the east side. He would connect to one of these XTRs that are in blue. He would be registered with the local site um, map server. Yeah. Right. And then that registration would be communicated. It's a different to IP. It's a different IP address because he was registering with a map server in the south site overlay. So does the plane have to change? Reconfigure that when it moves. No, no. This is map plane, register messages to that new place. The plane, here's, the plane connects through a radio region, right? In that radio region, there is a variety of technologies, all of which have agreed to deliver, uh, basically, uh, an OSPF update to the air-to-ground routers, stating uh, this IP address is here uh, with this metric. And we take that and we convert that metric and IP address into a series of priority weights and an EAD registration. That EAD registration goes to the local mapping system. How does it do that? That's what I'm asking. The IP address of that map server is different now. So you have to change it, right? Or is it the, when are I, you seeing the XDR? The, the, plane, the registration's not the happening in the plane. It's happening in the GGR. Is that what you're saying? In the air ground router, yes. So this plane moves here now. Yeah. It's going to send that message, right? That what that message? OSPF message, oh. and it's oh. going to that's going to trigger a discovery on the air ground router, which will trigger a registration with the local um, mapping system, which in turn triggers a map notification to the RTR, and then that registers with the overlay. Okay, so the planes are moving around, so it's just like an EID mobility problem, right. and right. and it's because it gleans the information from this OSPF packet that it knows that the new RLOC is this AGR in the East region, and since those guys are hard coded and can pre configured and pre provisioned, it registers to a new map server, right? Correct, correct, and then that registration trickles to the reencapsulating tunnel router, which is the only thing I drew in the other slides. How do you how do you remove the registration from the old map server? Does it have to time out on the south side? 
Um, no, actually, the, the metric, uh, a less preferable metric is sent, and that basically indicates the removal for these guys. And then the other thing, uh, actually, uh, I'm getting I'm getting that confused. When you register in the new site, you register with a, a better metric, and then we basically register with a better priority. Uh, Victor, sorry, you mentioned yeah. several times that you want uh, the original provider to be able to enforce policies, but how does it look? I mean, LISP normally is all about connectivity. Uh, you either provide connectivity or you don't, and uh, that's it. So when what? you say that provider has to control policy, um, what relation to LISP does it have? So if this if this uh, if this aircraft is connected in this region to this provider, this is the provider that would be authoritative to mandate the policy. He needs to be able to uh, know that they can define policy, enforce policy, and show that policy has been enforced to the local authorities. But does it mean that the traffic should be tunneled to that uh, provider? I mean, uh, how do you enforce policy if you don't see the traffic? Well, you do see the traffic. This is your. What do you mean by policy? Let, let's let's try it from the other end. What do you mean by policy? What kinds of policy are you trying to enforce that you need to be consistent about the list mapping system for? So there's going to be different things. Is the traffic going to go directly to another region? Should it go through a uh, DMZ in some co-location? Um, should it go through a particular RTR that aligns with these BGP peerings? And so these are policies essentially about the LISP response that they should get. Yes. Yeah. So. So basically, how how do I treat the traffic in the overlay okay. based on where I'm connecting? Yep, and where I'm trying to connect or where I'm trying to communicate to. I mean, the whole point of Lisp is to get your Lisp connectivity independent of your underlay connectivity. And what you're saying here is, you need the Lisp policy provided by the underlay provider, and therefore the the client, the the airplane, must connect to the Lisp mapping system in this domain. Um, and there's lots of, I'm not objecting to the abuse of LISP, that's okay, but it, it shouldn't be surprising that you need to change some behavioral things. And the biggest problem is you have to force a flush of the, of the caches. On, yes. On, um, in the, on and the, in the mapping system. Yeah, you have to flush which mapping system you're using and all of the cached information. And, as I, uh, and, and that's... Joel, so the, the caches on the XTRs at the site overlays always encapsulate a default to the edge routers. So a lot of them don't have, a lot of them don't have to be updated, right? But the mapping system, if I mean, it's I'm assuming the airplane is is participating in the list. Otherwise, this is all a non-issue. It is not. That's that's the thing that Victor didn't make extra clear. They're assigned EIDs and they just send messages to an air ground router, and the XTRs are on on the ground. Did I get that right, then, Victor? Then, then, then they automatically change XTRs, and the XTRs already are bound to their mapping system, and I don't understand the problem. He's right. And you have to use the same EIDs. You have to you have to arrange to be able to keep the same EIDs if you want things to work, keep TCP connectivity and the like. But if the airplane is not participating in the LISP, then the airplane moves. Fine. It talks to a different XTR. And lo and behold, it's but talking to a different XTR, mapping system. But that XTR doesn't talk to the same mapping system of the old XTR the plane was attached to. It's a different right. mapping system. You have That's to get the registration right. across somehow. Whether you use Uberlay or just Lisp, I don't care. But the thing that the XTR is talking to that gives that applies policy to its answers is separate. Correct. Correct. That is that is all uh, absolutely correct. I mean, um, from where I sit, what you're really doing is there is a common Lisp mapping system 
and it's just that it's the leaves are allowed to apply policy to the answers and you're implementing it funky. Okay. <laughs> Why do you call it funky? Because there's another mapping system that connects them together. That's it's not one of the standardized ones. That's all. Oh, right. Of course, which is allowed. We carefully segregated this. <laughs> you, you know, you designed that this this degree of decoupling from the beginning. <laughs> Why can't the overlay be a set of root and DDT nodes that connect the map servers that are sitting in each of the site overlays? That's that was kind of the question you asked that's, a few that's items. The discussion. That's, yep. that's the discussion, right? So if if I if I now take my single so now that we've got the different sites, right? And and you guys have articulated much better than I did that when a plane moves from one site overlay to another, it will be registered with a different site overlay mapping system, right? That that registration, take this airplane, for example, on the left, that registration will hit the site uh, mapping system and that would basically be propagated by the border router that connects to the overlay into the overlay mapping system. So actually, is, let's be clear, the plane doesn't register. He doesn't even know he's using Lisp. Right, he doesn't. Somehow the yeah. XTR yeah. figures out the plane is there, goes, oh, this EID is now here, and does essentially Lisp mobility to say, I'm the ETR for this guy now. <laughs> and the fact that he registers to a different map server uh, for that EID than where he was previously at, just means that the EID is moving map servers. Now, how you get a map request to find the new location means you move the mobility problem into the mapping system, which is not architecturally a good thing to do. The whole point yeah, of but mapping I can understand they're doing it. <laughs> you get a no, it's not architecturally good, but it, I can understand that part of the choice that they're making. The, the, air, the airplane folks have a different set of constraints they deal with. Yeah, well, so, so the problem is, is, is you don't have a single mapping service provider. So when you, the XTRs move around or when the EIDs move around, you don't want to um, register to that original one. So you've moved the mobility problem into the mapping system, which means in the, in the thing that connects them together, you have to push the updates around because now you have to tell other people that are sending map requests that it's not following the DDT hierarchy, it's following some other path. And that's what, and that's what, that was one of the options you were saying, Victor, is that maybe the map referral cache in the map resolvers get updated versus you try to run the referral hierarchy, right? Right. So that's one, that's one option. The other option is we move the mobility effectively into the mapping system. Um, I don't know if uh, um, the uh, descent uh, approach would help in this case, um, or maybe it's all just about being able to enforce policies. So if I look at how we do things in, um, in LISPSEC, where we actually add semantics to the to the keys and, and encryption and hashes that we're going to do as the lookup basically moves around the mapping system. That could be another way of actually securing the enforcement of the policies, at which point then it's okay for all the Boeing airplanes to register in one map system or for that map system to be authoritative. But as you move around, the registrations will actually flow through the local mapping systems, giving you an opportunity to enforce the policy that you decide as a local provider of connectivity. So do we, uh, uh, okay, uh, Victor, is, do you have to enforce the policy at registration time? Could you enforce it at map request time? It's always mm -hmm. at map request time. It's at map request time. It can't be so, at registration so time. So why not have why not have the XTRs register to the same XTRs everywhere register to the same map server because it's based on the EID that's being registered. And then the map requests flow to through different map resolvers. And then what the source destination pairs for that map request are, that's where the policy gets 
um, applied, which means there's a certain hour log set that gets returned versus no hour log set. And that can work with non list sites as well. That, that could be the basis for a solution. Um, the challenge we've had is that there are not only competing vendors involved, but there are uh, governments that you know, it's appropriate to call them competing, but in some cases they are involved as well. Uh, so this notion of controlling the database where things are registered and where the policy is enforced, it, it's important to them. Yeah, I had a feeling um, that requirement was going to come up, right? Right. But uh, if I think if we can show that you can unequivocally enforce your policy because of the flow of information, but, then that, but the European that Union, the European Union has to decide that if a plane flies over Europe, that if you're registering a map server in the U.S., that's okay. That's, as that's long as they can enforce me. their policy. Yeah, well, as long as now they that the plane, that. yeah, now that the plane is over Europe and it wants to talk to people, it sends map requests down to the air to ground and it uses the map resolvers in Europe and their, their policies could be enforced there. Would that be sufficient? Yeah, that, that, actually, the airplane is not uh, using anything. It's actually just connecting to the, an XTR that is in Europe. So the, the XTR in Europe has to register to the mapping server of, of a di different domain. Yes. And, uh, and anything that might be yeah, okay. that's what that's what threw me for a while. It's the actually the XTRs who have to do this and it's the XTRs who want to enforce policy. So it seems like they can do the right thing. Yes, right. It would be the it would be these these are two, I mean the XTRs in Europe always register with the same mapping system. It would be the RTRs that connect to the overlay that would register with anywhere we want to anchor it. So but say, if but if but if you're willing to allow it to register with a map server in another domain, then you can solve this with DDT only. So that's simpler. Yeah, <laughs> I think we all yeah, like we keeping like it simpler. Yeah, I would I would like that, uh, and then the the item to explore it would then be. Um, what are the mechanisms to maintain them in control of their own policies and destiny in you terms of that map request time. Being utilized? utilized? What's that? Control the policies at map request time for the planes that are flying over their domain. The XTR at the edge of their domain controls what responses. The only thing you got to do, there's not even a cache to flush because there is no cache. I keep thinking there's a cache to flush, but there isn't even that. It just works. Yeah, agree. Well, okay. So since they land over the XTRs in the region, those XTRs have complete control of the policy there. Well, right. actually, of who you send to, how you receive packets back is the opposite direction. So it's a send only policy, right? Yeah, Not well, it's got to be a send only policy. That was intrinsic in the problem definition. Yeah, right, right. Yes. Yeah, send only subject to. From where to where are you trying to communicate, which is evaluated at request time? Yep. And what you do is you make the map resolver on any cast address of like 1.1.1. And um, well, you don't have to do that because we're not running a list. I was going to say, then you just send the so map what, request to the same place. Is that, well, they can all share the 1.1.1 address and agree to that, I think. Um, but they don't have they, to. You don't, don't yeah. Have. You yeah, don't they don't have, have to because right. they're configured. You're going to have a the, whole list. Right? Yeah, right, right. So, well, yeah, the, the key is that there isn't a an international organization that is going to run that overlay mapping system, right? So they all need to put a server there and, you know, peer with each other and then decide, okay, uh, it just so happened that uh, the uh, U.S. decided to host all the Boeing aircraft, if that's how they want to structure it. Right. Well, what you do is you make those roots, DDT roots, at each of those boundaries where you have that triangle. And then those DDT roots then send referrals to map servers based on the EID. And you have a two level DDT hierarchy and you're done. The map servers are in each of the domains and the roots is the Uberlay equivalent, but it's not a mapping system. It's part of the same mapping system. Much, much simpler. 
And you can clarify on that, Dino. Would, would that be MR? Yeah. See, clarify yeah. on that, Dino. Would that mean that two uh, Boeing aircraft uh, that are associated with the US mapping system and that happen to be flying over Europe, would the resolution go through the US even though they both are in Europe? Just to clarify what you said. The map request would be initiated by the European XDRs. And yes, they would actually, they wouldn't flow all the way to the US because the map resolvers over Europe would have a map referral cache. And so they, um, well, yes, they would have to then, they wouldn't have to go through the routes. They wouldn't have to talk to those three nodes. It would have to forward the map request to the map server in the US. Yes. Be careful. There's a difference between how far does it flow and who gets to apply policy. The point is that you said, can the local device apply policy? And that it can. That's what we're trying to give you. And the policy you said was the critical part, constraint. Yeah, the policy has to be part of the referral cache because it's send only based. So the map server is receiver based, right? So, so in this example here, I'm trying to show only the triangle in the overlay. Right. right. This example here um, of a referral cache, my um, all my nodes are populated with um, a list of where to go and get the information for a particular set of prefixes. Um, so what the servers policy would be. A, sorry. What map servers? It's like a referral cache. So That's what you have there. Okay. These, map servers in the diagram, right? Um, so west, south, and east. And uh, I issue a map request. I forward it to the authoritative map server per the referral cache. Um, normally, I would apply my policy here in the south, but we're saying that we want to apply it um, there, you're right. On west, right? So, yeah. so the question in my mind is, is those, I, maybe I just don't understand things well enough and, and the mechanisms are already in place to do that. Um, but that's where I would need some help uh, to understand that. Uh, when, I, when I get my reply, the replies um, in these diagrams that I put together, I'm sending the reply directly to the XTR. I think it could be proxied through uh, their map servers their I, th maps, maps. I think you don't have to do that because if the reply comes back it could come back directly because you've already went through the policy and you've permitted the map request to continue if the map request was denied at msw then you wouldn't tell mss anything I, it may be, there may there may be a need I and mean, it's hard to know without knowing what the policies really yeah. are there may there may be a need to play a game with telling making sure because everybody can agree that the home servers provide all the answers so that the right. the local server the server that the xtrs actually talk to because we're talking distributed system can apply policy on the answer and you're basically running a federated system and you just it's what you apply you have different policies because that applies in different places i'm not saying it's trivial but it seems like it maps much better to what lisp does right okay so so keep the registrations in in one place right so all girls on the west all boys on the on the south no matter where they move and then uh if the reply comes through your uh, requesting infrastructure, then at that point you can make sure that you enforce the policies. Basically, that, that's how I would suggest doing it. Yeah, agree. So then this this response wouldn't go directly; it would actually go through the through the West Map Server and triangulate that way. At that point, I enforce the policy at reply time. Yeah, okay. maybe the policy allows it the request to go, but maybe the information that's returned needs to be filtered by the home side. So yes, you might have to follow the return tracks of the request. Maybe we have to, like Joel says, you got to look at the policies in detail, right? Yeah, and I, I can I can keep working with Ico on that. But what I'm hearing is that we may not need any new machinery. This would just the policy enforcement would just be a matter of implementation on a map resolver. 
Is that, That's what I'm hoping. Is that, and those three nodes are DDT routes of the same mapping system where the map servers are spread across all the regions. Right. It's the EID, it's like a, always, that determines the map server you register to. I think I mean, they, uh, go ahead. Uh, it's just an idea. Uh, so we, the, the use case we are looking at is slightly different from what we are used to in Lisp. So that's why, um, in my opinion, we had a, a slightly hard time to get our heads around this use case. So one thing would be uh, have a, a clear problem statement, maybe written with uh, ICAO on what 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 the system needs to do. This is one thing. And then with the working group can express, do we have already all the machinery? Once we really have understood the, 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 the use case, the problem, do we have all the machinery or we, we Uberlay uh, is the solution? In that case, this problem statement just can go in the Uberlay document or, or okay. we extend the problem the, the statement and we say, here is how to apply Lisp how it is or with these changes in order to solve the problem. I think. Right. Okay, yeah, we can work on that. I think we need to do that anyway to to get to get yeah, places it, with ICAO. Even for Uberlay, I mean, since it would be good to have a nice introduction in what use case you are solving. So in worst case, this text would go in that document. See. Okay. Yeah, I I think this whole notion of uh, policy jealousy within the overlay that's more of a um, you know consortium type use case, uh, which isn't necessarily always the case for for overlay. Um, but uh, but okay, point taken. I think I think we can do that. Yeah. So oh, I, I will spare you the other idea I had because <laughs> that was really ugly. You are so kind. And I will keep it in the slides, but I don't think there's a point in, in going over over that. That that is uh, attempting to keep the registrations in the um, in the connected uh, control plane and then there's a ton of signaling and some flooding of the signaling. I, I, I think, I mean, in, in being respectful of everyone's time, I think I'm going to spare you guys from, from that. That sounds like a BGP alt type solution, or you could use BGP uh, alt to, to, to do the flooding if you wanted to. I'd like to think it's a little better, but uh, it's not better enough to actually uh, justify Unless you guys are curious about it. Uh, it is getting a little late. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, it, it's a nice problem. To be honest, it's, it's a nice use case. It would be nice if, if the working group helps uh, solving it. So, so let, me, let me take the AI and um, get more precision on the, on the requirements, uh, specify exactly which policies we're talking about, and I think that would help everyone. Uh, uh, anchor, anchor to thinking. I mean, it's yeah, it's all too easy to solve the wrong problem because we can all think of all sorts of interesting problems. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Okay, very good. That's basically all I had. Um, I think we touched on all the all the points I I wanted to touch on. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks and again. thanks to folks for staying on and participating in the discussion. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Thanks all. Organizing everything. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. bye.